Takate hao ki te uru, whakatekate hao ki te tonga, ki a mākina kina ki uta, ki a mātara tara ki tai, e he ake ana te atakura, he tio, he huka, he hohu, tihe i mori ora. Good morning and welcome to what is our last Finance and Performance Committee meeting of this Triennium of Council. Um, and I wanted to take the opportunity to, to just make some remarks as we go into the meeting. I would naturally have done this at the end, but we're obviously going to be going into public excluded partway through the meeting. Sam will be in the chair at that point, and I did want to make the, the remarks I'm going to make while um, people were, were in the room. So I'll just take the opportunity to do that very briefly now. Um, and really, it's around um, acknowledgements. I'd like to acknowledge the the management and, and the staff that support this committee, um, the significant amount of work that goes into supporting the committee, um, not only in the room at the meeting, um, not only preparing for the answers to the many questions we often get in these meetings, um, but the significant preparation that goes into putting the agenda together, preparing the papers, um, helping me to manage what often can be quite a complicated run sheet with um, time pressures, with externals, um, a need for, for really managing the timing of the, um, the meeting as well. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the work that we as a group have done in this term of council, um, building on the work that, that Raf and I really started in 2013 and, um, and developed from there, simplifying and modifying the regular reports to make them more visual, to make them easier to understand, easier to call out the relevant information, reporting by exception, so making the reports more succinct, um, and realizing that the audience for those reports isn't only councillors, but the community and the media as well. So packaging the information in a way that's relevant and that makes it easy to understand and to call out those matters that are, are really important. I'd also like to acknowledge the um, very full role that Sam has played as, as Deputy Chair, um, covering my various conflicts and, and other areas where there's been a, a need for Sam to be in the chair, but also the way that you and I have worked together really constructively in the background um, to continue to make the improvements to the way the committee runs and the way the reports are that I referred to er earlier. I think it's, um, it's fair to say that we've worked together really well for the benefit of the, the committee and its work. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge the high level of engagement around the table um, on matters which often are of the utmost importance to us as governors. So my hope is that the legacy of this committee and the work that we've done since 2013 provides a really solid foundation for the next council to be building on. Um, as chair, I always feel really well supported in these meetings. So once again, I'd just like to um, thank everybody involved in helping the, the meetings run smoothly and enabling the committee to be the, the success that I really feel it has been. So thank you very much indeed. Um, not calling anybody out by name, but to everybody that's involved in, um, in making the committee run smoothly and um, the success that it's been. Um, Leah, I understand you wanted to um, just make a couple of comments as well. Yeah, just, just to, from a staff perspective, um, yeah, it is the last FMP, but especially your last FMP, and just wanted to acknowledge from a staff perspective um, how we've always found you very considered and um, professional and we've really appreciated working with you. And just on a final note, I did promise cake today, so I have got a cake. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a cake and we out the back for morning tea. Oh, great. So we'll break for morning tea around 11 o'clock um, and there will be cake and knives and napkins out the back for anybody that wants to grab it. Right. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> the, the plastic. <laughs> so that might depend how the first part of the meeting goes. Yeah. All right, so um, thanks very much for um, indulging us in that. I'll now move to the formal business of the meeting, starting with apologies. Um, and I've got um, apologies for early departure um, from Mike Davidson, Sarah Templeton and Anne Galloway. And I'm just noting that Pauline Cotter is joining us on Zoom today. So I'm happy to move those apologies. Um, Samuel second. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Against. That's carried. Thank you. 
Um, now, declarations of interest, we'll just get those up on the screen. Um, there are a number of declarations that we're noting because of people being on um, various boards and so on. Um, if anything additional comes up um, during the meeting, please make it known. But those are the declarations that we're um, recording as we move into the meeting today, so we'll just note those. Um, confirmation of previous minutes. Um, I'm happy to move the minutes of the Finance and Performance meeting, uh, meeting from the 26th of May. Do I have a seconder? Aaron. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Against. That's carried. Um, resolution to include supplementary reports. Um, so resolving that we include item 22. I'm happy to move. Um, Aaron will second. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Against. That's carried. And now moving to item four, the public forum. Now, Alexandra Davids, as chair of the Waikura Limwood Central Heathcote Community Board, um, you've got um, public forum item um, just to update us on some community feedback, and we appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Jordan, thank you so much. Um, just two so more. Just two more. Hello. Um, so I just wanted to give an update on um, some of the things that have been happening around the uh, Waikura board um, and also with public meetings. So uh, the board have written letters to the CDHB and the Minister of Health. Um, so we are waiting for updates on those so we can get briefings. Um, those um, briefings will um, also include members of our contact group that we have. Um, that are working um, alongside council staff. So we're really looking forward to that, um, to actually get some proper updates. Um, and I guess that brings me on to my next point, uh, which is around the uh, public meetings that we've had. So I went to the one um, ooh, yesterday, no, the day before, um, during the day. And I think a massive theme that came from that um, obviously people are having concerns around insurance issues um, and damage to properties and things like that. Um, but the real main issue that came out of that was the health concerns. And um, I think we've acknowledged that council have taken a long time to get on board with the wastewater treatment um, issues, um, but that's been totally acknowledged. And um, I just want to say a massive thank you to contractors for their amazing work that they have done. Um, that trickling filter being empty is so fantastic. Great, great timing. Um, but for the community in particular, their main issue is around the health concerns and I guess the timing around um, getting that up and running and underway. Um, and I believe you're going to be getting more information or have had more information around that. So we're looking forward to that information as a board as well. Um, but yeah, I think I also wanted to bring up today um, just our responsibility as elected members and as leaders um, around our messaging that we're giving our community. While I've come and spoken to council quite a lot around the wastewater treatment plant issues, um, I've been quite mindful of the fact that I've not used the word Bromley and I've tried to keep it as a citywide issue. Um, I'm concerned that we are raising more um, mental health issues for people in the area. They're already dealing with health, health issues. They're already dealing with the impacts of what they're going through. But I think as elected members, we need to be trying to actually give people hope and make them stop feeling as much like they're in this big black hole so, um, and it is a bit of a black hole at the moment, let's be fair. Um, and we know that this community in particular has had to deal with a lot of different issues. But I think we need to start changing our messaging in order for more hope to come back to that community, for people to have less well-being issues. Um, so, yeah, I would just really like to bring that up today. I think it is our responsibility as leaders and elected members to start changing um, perceptions and, um, yeah, the impact of those perceptions on that community. So, yeah, 
<laughs> Great. Look, thank you very much indeed for taking the time to um, come along and, and draw our attention to that this morning for those comments. Um, we'll be dealing with the um, wastewater treatment plant recovery update. The presentation is the first item on our agenda today. So um, what the, the comments that you've made um, flow perfectly into that first item that we're, we're considering. So thank you very much indeed for taking the time to come along this Perfect. morning. Thank, thank you. you. All right, so moving then to the next items on the agenda. Um, item five, deputations by appointment. There are none. Presentation of petitions, item six. There are none. So that now sees us move to item seven, the Christchurch Wastewater Treatment Plant Recovery Update Presentation. Um, so this will take the form of a slide presentation by our own staff. Um, I'd then also like to welcome Dr. Cheryl Brunton, the um, Medical Officer of Health, to join us. Um, so if we take the presentation, if we then take the um, uh, comments from Cheryl Brunton, the update from Cheryl Brunton, and then we'll move into questions after that. Thank you. Um, thanks, Andrew. Um, kia ora koutou. Um, so what we've got up on the slide is the order of the presentation this morning. So we're going to very quickly go through an update of what's happened in the last couple of weeks since we um, briefed elected members. Um, and we really want the focus of today's briefing to be on the, um, the medical um, well-being and the, um, the mental well-being of the communities that are being affected by the odour. Um, and as Andrew, you've acknowledged, we've got um, representatives of the... Um, DHB here today to talk directly to that. Um, so like usual, I've got um, most of the team here. I've got quite a few of the team away um, unwell. Um, so um, apologies if, if you do have questions for us that we can't answer. We'll do our best. So um, we will start off with uh, Gary. Um. Good morning, everybody. Oh, I'm going to be really fast as I go through this. Uh, so um, I guess the gist of the first slide really is that payments have slowed down considerably over the last two weeks. Um, we are currently um, investigating, having a look uh, to bring back an options report for you to the 28th of July. When it comes back on the 28th of July, it will have been peer reviewed by the partner groups. You can see up there, it would have been peer reviewed by the community liaison group as well. So when we're back on the 28th of July, um, hopefully um, that will be uh, an options report that has been um, across a broad spectrum of people. Um, just move to the next one quickly. Uh, this is just to show the map of the out of zones um, obviously the end zone is greyed out there, uh, the dots around the outside, the greens are um, applications we've accepted, the reds are applications that we've declined. Um, we're currently running at about 53, 54% of uh, um, out of zone applicants have been accepted. Um, I'm holding fast to the um, health, um, uh, health wind and everything else. However, when we come back on the 28th, I've been made aware of uh, some monitoring reports that are changing. Um, history and climate will definitely change in the next few months. So um, the zone, uh, one of the options may look quite different to what's up there now. Uh, the schools, uh, I guess just to say, um, I think I'm about 99% through, I can't say 99, the mass doesn't work. Let's say 90% are through all of the invoices and they are through for processing of payments. Um, uh, really, that's all that's on that page, really. Uh, yeah, it was pretty quick, but I realise there's more important people than me here today. OK, so Bruce will now just give you a bit of an update of what we've been doing with um, business support. So um, as you know, last time we talked a little bit about some of the businesses um, putting their hands up and asking for a bit of assistance. So we've had Bruce working on that. Yep. So this is an emerging piece of work over the last couple of weeks um, since it's been raised. Um, we've started through working with some of the major agencies, uh, the Chamber of Commerce and Christchurch NZ to, uh, to see what they had heard, what um, themes were coming through. Uh, they then directed us to some initial fo uh, f uh, affected businesses and we're starting to uh, have meetings with those. 
Um, so far, what I'm hearing is that uh, the impact on workers is the key issue that they're facing um, and that we need to make sure we're getting that feedback and communication through to, to those businesses uh, and using them as a channel. And we're starting to have those discussions with our, uh, our comms team around working with businesses to provide uh, communication as well. Um, it's been a bit of a snowball as businesses have um, identified other businesses. We're starting to make those contacts and then go and have those further discussions. Um, in terms of ideas for help, I know that that you know, is often the focus that you, you were wanting to take. Um, it's really communication at this stage, um, but we will, as we gather further information from affected businesses, we'll um, take those ideas on board that they raise as well. Yeah. Hi, Nigel Grant from Environmental Health. Uh, just at the, the first two points, we can take that, is um, we've, we've completed the grab sampling, we've presented that previously, and also that it'll be discussed further as well. Uh, Shira will also talk about the fact hydrogen sulphide is one of the primary gases that we identified as, as causing uh, issues for people, and it, it's one, fortunately, that can be uh, easily detected with our monitors. So. Um, yeah, so we, we've currently started with one, then two more monitors that are in place now that are doing continuous monitoring. We have uh, further six monitors, which will be 4G, so they, they won't have to be visited into the, in the field, uh, and they're, they're on their way to us at the moment. Um, just yeah, So we would like to think that in another week or two we'll have those up and active as well. So, um, just quickly, that, that shows you the extent of the um, where the grab samples were taken from. They're the, they're the maps, and uh, we started off just around the pond, and then uh, our, our consultant who was doing the work uh, became, obviously became quite interested in following the wind and where the smell was, and so has, has just broadened out. And on the day follow, on the days that the sampling were due, um, yeah, just just followed the wind and, and where the odours was, and so we ended up with quite a diverse. Um, collection of sample sites o over time. So um, the next, this, this slide here is, is uh, showing where, the, um, where we're proposing to put the, put the monitors. So you can see there the ones, the, the red ones will be the long-term monitoring that we'll have in place the whole time. And we'll hold, hold back a couple of uh, metres that uh, guys can place from week to week in different locations as well to start building up uh, more information, and you see down there in the right-hand corner is a um, kind of wind rose, which which shows that that the wind conditions of June to September, based on previous years, shows shows the wind direction. So that's obviously where our sampling sites ref reflect that. Uh, that's pretty much it. So there's been there's been discussion about um, the, the you know what's what's an accept what's a safe or acceptable level for um, hydrogen sulphide in particular, and it, and it is, is, is difficult. No New Zealand agency seems to have a, a definite um, definite levels, but we've, we've just put some ones up there for you. So it's, um, yeah, we've discussed it's, it's definitely strong and offensive, even at very low concentrations. And one of, I've spoken before, also there's a meth, methyl mercaptan, which is um, also very odorous, uh, and, and can be detected at extremely low levels, way below any level which will call, actually cause physical harm. So that that's there as well. But focusing on hydrogen sulphide uh, has a has a wide range of um, de detection level, and it uh, apparently decreases with age as well. So people have different different reaction to to its you know whether they can smell it or not. I'm probably a good example of that. I when I, the smell that I smell is usually the methyl mercaptan rather than hydrogen sulphide. Um, yeah, so the, the concentrations are, um, at the, yeah, are above the odour threshold. Yeah, the, the concentrations can be substantially above the odour threshold and that, that can lead to annoying and discomforting symptoms such as your headaches and nausea. There was a work safe level up there as well. That's obviously quite a bit higher, but that, that reflects on the fact that People that are exposed to that level uh, for eight hours, and then they they spend the balance of their time in fresh air. But it is relevant. Um, we we have staff there at the plant, and also there's quite a um, 
a swathe of industrial um, area as well where, where people have staff and I've certainly spoken to businesses about how they can what they can do for their staff in those areas so they are affected by the, the wind drifts down that road um, so the principal one we're using is, is that Californian Office of Environmental Health Assessment um, and it, it is point, point oh 0.03 parts per million and it, you can see there that it's, um, it's detected at yeah, 83% 80, of people um, will smell it at that level and 40% will find it discomforting. So that, just going back to the one above, it's a, um, it has quite a, wide, quite a wide range of how it affects people. So that's cool. The, um, yeah, so there's, there's just a shot of, um, now that we're starting to get some information from the monitors, uh, there's, we'll, um, we'll look at um, how we can best start to uh, report that back onto our website in a, in a, in a, f a readable, friendly manner to show, to show what we're recording. That one there is the wind directions on top and the levels detected underneath. And you can see it obviously corresponds um, pretty closely. That, that site is um, Bromley School out, and it's driven by the uh, northeast wind, so you can see the responses there. That's, that's just a, um, a shot. The meter's not there normally. That was just a shot taken by, um, yeah, t taken by our consultant who's, um, yeah, they're now going to uh, have got a bit of a future in producing a coffee table book of oxidation ponds around the country with the photography. But so that, that's where it sits. That, that's what it looks like. And we're just putting those in um, a variety of locations, as I showed you around there before. So bird life at the ponds. I spoke to, um, you know, I understand there's been some interest in that. Um, I'm environmental health. I'm not ecology. But I've, I caught up with Andrew Crossland yesterday. And... Um, yeah, so the points from him are, that you can see there, that there's only Canada geese remaining at the ponds and some shag species roost in nearby trees. Um, all other bird life that relied on the midges or their larvae as a food source have left the ponds. They've gone away, there's, there's not the food source there for them anymore. Um, and obviously that, um, that's, that's a reaction to the reduced water quality. Um, there was an earlier avian botulism outbreak at the ponds, but that's not the reason for all of the birds disappearing, obviously. And equally, Andrew's very clear that the chemicals used in the firefighting are not considered to be the reason why we've seen a, you know, almost a complete absence. He sent me a photo, I, I haven't put it up, sorry, but you know, he sent me a photo of the ponds that are just covered in birds, and, and we, whereas you see that picture there before, they've, they've, um, they've gone, so, yeah. So collaborative meeting with medical officer of health, I've said before we're having those on a very regular basis. I just, I'll use this heading also just to note, um, Yani has asked about whether we've had contact with Niwa. We have had contact with Niwa. Niwa have, um, their position is people ringing in, talking to them, is that they're, they're directed to um, regional council. Niwa say the air quality is not, is not, not what they do for, uh, a regulatory type type issue, so they're not the same. They're not the same as MFE, for instance. They're they're essentially another consultant group. However, they it was really good. I I got to speak to one of their um, air quality scientists up in Auckland. She's very much involved in um, particular measuring particular particular matter wood wood burners. That's what they're working on at the moment. How, however, she was very interested for me to give her an overview of what we're doing. She equally knows knows of the. We have three staff um, with three scientists that are supporting us through Ministry of Health, our own consultant, and Ecan. She knows all those people. She says they really, you know, says we're in we're, we're in very strong hands with them, and that's that's really what Niwa and they are very interested to keep in contact with us as well. So next time they're passing through Christchurch, I'll, I'll arrange a meeting with our scientists with with their one. Um, so paint. Paint staining. We've talked about that um, previously. The mold, mold types have been found um, to be typical for an out, outdoor environment, and th this, the, so the discoloration we're seeing is not attributed to um, any any mold, unusual mold species. However, this uh, just at the end of this week, tomorrow, we have our consultant uh, going out and testing a number of houses, um, looking at other reasons for that staining, and we'll be able to report back on that. I would hope um, within two weeks, and just. Just to uh, finally just talk about noise, I've previously said we've, um, we're looking at the noise, the, the, 
it's gone okay with the first um, the first filter. The second filter, the way it's worked out is that the chipper is end up going to be screened more from Shorten Street as well. So we're predicting that that's that's not going to cause a lot of distraction for uh, the residents. So that's pretty much me. <coughs> Uh, Adam Tews, Manager of Operations, just giving an update on the interim operations. Um, pictures you see up there is the completed bypass um, pipe for to get past the trickling filters. So that's fully completed and we're just in the stages of commissioning and testing that pipeline now this week. Um, we did set up the temporary pumps there that we've seen to try and get a kickstart on growing the biomass needed for the activated sludge plant. That has now been switched off so that we can enable the final installation of the 16 permanent pumps that are going in now because they physically sit in the way of that. The 16 permanent pumps are installed and being commissioned next week as well. Uh, so the pumps obviously have to be connected via pipework and the last stage of that pipework now is also going in and that will also be completed next week. So in summary, the new temporary activated sludge plant, which will replace the function of the trickling filters, should be completed by next week. It will take two to three weeks for the biomass to grow um, to, for that process to be fully operational. Unfortunately, trying to kickstart that biological process in the depths of winter is, is not ideal. Normally, you try and start this process in the summer where it's nice and warm conditions for the bugs to grow. Um, hence why we're predicting up to three weeks for that to become fully operational. Uh, good morning, Helen Beaumont, uh, look after three waters. So as Adam has pointed out, we're sort of 95, maybe 98% of the way there with the interim operations and getting the equipment in place. Unfortunately, until 100% is in place and we're putting the wastewater through that process, we continue to overload our oxidation ponds. So they are still performing poorly given those high loads and the very cool temperatures we're having through the winter. Uh, we are doing some parallel works to assist those ponds, so we're still dosing uh, hydrogen peroxide, which degrades into oxygen and water, at the outlet of the, um, of the plant and into those oxidation ponds to increase the oxygen levels. We've also got mechanical aerators both in the pond and being sourced from around the country, and we do have one supplier who has offered to trial uh, a different type of aerator, and we're looking into that. We are also considering some chemical dosing of the ponds to interfere with the production of hydrogen sulphide, so that, that work's going on in the background. In terms of the timelines for pond recovery, uh, until that biomass is established in the activated sludge basins, uh, we won't see fresh water going into those ponds, so we won't see much better quality wastewater. And so we need to wait that three weeks for the biomass to establish, and then it'll take another at least three weeks and maybe a little longer for the water to flush through those six ponds. So we've got six ponds. They're quite, um, they're quite big ponds, uh, and it takes a month or so for the water to pass all the way through. Uh, now, the result of all of that is that our wastewater discharge through the offshore outfall continues to exceed the standard values in our resource consent, and so we continue to notify Environment Canterbury and the Medical Officer of Health of those faecal coliform and enterococci values as we're required. Uh, and in response, we've doubled our beach sampling. So we sample at three places along the beach to check that it's not affecting the coastal water quality. Uh, and we're pleased to report that those high bacterial loads going out three kilometres offshore are not affecting the results at the beach. So the, the results at the beach are within standard values. Uh, and we're also doing some shellfish sampling because the, um, the beach sampling is a grab sampling, but the shellfish sample the water for us all the time. So we're doing some shellfish sampling to, um, to check on those. And we haven't got all the results back yet. Um, the preliminary results are looking good, but um, we're waiting for all of, the, all of the various determinants for that. In terms of um, interim operations, one of, the, um, one of the things we've talked about before is that the... The plant as it was, um, was a very robust and resilient operation, and we had a lot of redundancy. So if something broke down, we could simply divert the, the, um, the wastewater, shut down a small part of the plant, do the maintenance work, and then bring it back online. 
during the interim operation of the plant, we don't have that resilience and redundancy and robustness of process. So we are doing some work. Um, the, first of all, the interim operation has been designed and installed to last for up to five years. So we haven't just done it for 12 months or 24 months in terms of best case scenario for the replacement plant. We have put it in place for up to five years to ensure that we have good operational capability through that time. We've also reviewed what we need to hold on site in terms of critical spares. In the past, we held critical spares, but just what we needed given the redundancy in the plant. Now we don't have that redundancy, we've increased the list and scope of those critical spares and we're obtaining those so that they're on the shelf at the plant and we don't run into supply difficulties. Uh, and you, you, we're all aware of what the supply chains are like at the moment. Uh, the other thing we've done is review all of our maintenance schedules. So um, the maintenance on the plant has increased uh, to make sure that we don't get uh, any breakdowns or we minimise the number of breakdowns we uh, experience on the plant. Uh, and in the background behind that, we're also very closely monitoring the wastewater through the treatment process. So we've set up a little mini lab that the treatment plant operators can use rather than relying on our, our large lab. We're still doing the, the main sampling through the large lab, but they can do some quick physical and chemical and biological tests themselves on a daily or even hourly basis if they're worried about something and get an instant feedback and, um, and change the operation of the plant straight away. Uh, and we've co-located uh, our capital works team for works on the plant site with our operations team to make sure that um, anything happening on the site doesn't interfere unnecessarily with the, the good operation of the plant. So um, we do have, of course, good discussions between our capital works teams that are based in Civic and our operations teams out at the plant. But given how busy the site is at the moment, we decided that co-locating those teams to improve that further uh, was a good idea. And then I'll whip back up to the top. Um, we are, of course, the options assessment for replacement is underway and for the replacement treatment process. And we expect to get a report to you in November or December, so towards the end of this year. Thanks, Emma. I'll keep this quick in the uh, interest of time. Um, so firstly, good morning, everyone. Um, the first of the structures, um, if not by now, certainly by close of play tomorrow, will be completely emptied of filter media. Uh, that's six weeks ahead of the scheduled um, date. Um, we are on schedule for um, uh, starting removal of media from the second structure, which will commence next week. Um, so at this stage, um, we are comfortable that we will be um, on track to remove media before the 7th of September. Um, you can see on the right hand side of the slide up there, there's an infographic. That infographic goes up on Council's public uh, facing website uh, end of each week. And that just gives a quick tally uh, for people to look at to see how many truck loads, uh, truck and trailer loads have, have left the site. Um, how much uh, media in terms of tonnage has been removed in total plus for the week. Uh, gives a little information on wind direction. There's some information up there too on the um, public support, uh, community support package. And um, I guess the key one is in the top right hand corner. Uh, it shows the two trickling filters and the amount of media that has been um, removed from both. Um, as seeing is believing, there's a picture that was taken, uh, I think it was Wednesday, Tuesday this week, um, that shows uh, the first structure. Um, all that's left within it is some of the uh, dribs and drabs at the bottom um, and the central uh, tower that um, supported the uh, rotating um, trickler arms. Um, so that will be um, effectively cleaned out uh, by the end of this week and next week as already stated they'll be commencing removal of the media on the second structure. Okay. Kia ora koutou, Simon Maka, I am the Senior Communications Advisor. Uh, so just giving you a quick update on communications over the past couple of weeks. We're still continuing to roll out um, Newsline blog items every two or three, two or three times a day. Um, that can be anything from you know, just a simple wind forecast for the coming day, um, progress on site with photos, um, how the community support package is going, or any testing that gets published, we can cross promote it straight from the blog to the website. The website itself, we're also updating two to three times a week. 
Uh, we'll continue to respond to questions and updates uh, about the community support and the on-site works as people send them through via social media or just general media queries. Uh, we put a video up last week or the week before now uh, just to show you know how we've uh, modified the plant um, and, and the different measures we've had to put in place since the November fire. We're also working on another video now to show how the two processes are different. So one, how the wastewater treatment plant worked before the fire and then another one about how it works after the fire and the different modifications have made along the way to um, make sure that that treatment process continues. Uh, still continuing to put out weekly e-newsletter. Um, that is also done in a hard copy version that's uh, made available at our uh, community providers and is also made into an A2 poster that is put on the uh, information plinths um, at the community providers as well. Um, and we've also put out some flyers via the community advisory group um, to promote the public meetings that we've had, the two we had this week, and, and also working on a different flyer for the South Shore, South New Brighton, um, just because we might be able to um, put some information around the webinar that we've got planned as well. Um, just It is a smaller space at the South Shore, South New Brighton Community Centre, and we just want to make sure that everyone's got access to the information. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, so what's coming up? Um, our fourth public meeting is uh, on the evening of the 7th of July um, at uh, South New Brighton Community Centre. Um, we have a webinar planned for the 13th of July. Um, Adam has already touched on the uh, pumps, the 16 pumps that are being installed. Uh, Nigel's talked to you already about the 4G monitoring devices that are being rolled out over the next couple of weeks. Um, I've touched on the ramp for Filter 2 is on schedule. It'll be completed by the end of this rate week with removal of media commencing beginning of next week. Um, we're continuing investigations to determine what the discolouring on uh, paint is and our social recovery response plan is uh, progressing well. Um, right, just as a segue to um, having Cheryl and Lucy here, um, as um, Alexandra said, we had two public meetings on Tuesday um, at the Bromley Community Centre. Um, by far the, the key issues that came through the questions and the comments from the community mem members who attended was around health impacts. So how people were feeling um, both in terms of their mental wellbeing but also their physical wellbeing. So there were a lot of questions around health and it's such a really perfect timing um, that Cheryl and Lucy is now, now going to sort of present to you um, their views on, on what's been happening and um, their role. Um, so can I just invite um, Cheryl, um, Medical Officer of Health, and um, Dr Lucy Dave, um, who, and we've been working with um, both these very talented women um, to line up both our response and the response of the um, health professionals. So Cheryl and Lucy, thanks very much indeed for joining us this morning. We appreciate you, you being here and the time that you're taking to, to do so. Um, and obviously look forward to um, hearing what you've got to tell us. Thank you. Uh, kia ora koutou and thank you for this opportunity. Just uh, one of the things that might be important to point out, Lucy and I both work for Community and Public Health, which is the Canterbury District Health Board's um, service for, which provides regional public health services to Canterbury, South Canterbury and West Coast, as it happens. Other parts of the DHB, such as planning and funding, commission and fund services, and of course you will be familiar, I'm sure, with the fact that the DHB itself runs services Primary care is funded by, but not directly provided by the, the DHP. So just kind of putting us in context, because some of the questions we've been asked actually relate to other parts of the DHP other than ourselves. Essentially, we're providing a support role and have done for council's response. And we're involved, as has already been alluded to, in two of those council-led work streams, the, particularly the environmental monitoring stream and social response. It's been my role as one of the medical officers of health to be part of that environmental monitoring. And Lucy has been part of the social response group along with the other agencies that you're aware of. In terms of how we're managing that internally within community and public health, we're aiming to coordinate our input across both of those groups so that essentially uh, Lucy and I are the touch points for those particular groups and we're working to provide a coordinated response from our end. So essentially, just a quick what we've done so far, one of the first things that we did was to engage an independent air quality consultant to provide peer review of our advice on exposure and risk assessment. 
Um, we've done so through the services that the Ministry of Health is able to provide to us, and that's been, as, I, as others have alluded to, invaluable. Um, to have a, a, a number of very qualified minds working together around this. We've also provided through that monitoring group advice around exposure assessments, so I've been actively involved in the decisions around the locations of monitoring. Um, and also we have sought advice from other public health units throughout New Zealand where they've had experience of dealing with populations affected by exposure to foul odours. And there are, there are some of those, but unfortunately that hasn't been hugely fruitful in terms of advising us of anything that we perhaps didn't already know. We have also sought information from local general practices and Pegasus Health, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment, and also from Healthline and the National Poison Centre in terms of being able to uh, identify health effects. We have considered Council's request to set up a health register, and I'm going to say a little bit more about that shortly. The other thing that we have done is to link um, City Council into the CDHB's planning and funding division regarding the possibility of funding general practice visits for affected people. The, we've approached seven practices in the east of the city. We cast the net quite widely through to at least three kilometres radius of the oxidation ponds. And most of those local general practices, with the exception of one, had reported no increase in consultations in relation to the health effects of the odour. But there's an important qualifier to that in that what we were told by the practices is that whilst people are not specifically making appointments to saying I'm being affected by the odour and I want to talk to the doctor, most of them, the reporting that they were able to provide us around the symptoms people were experiencing was from people who were attending the practice but for other reasons. As interestingly, also from some of their own staff who live within the areas that where people are exposed. Now, the common, most commonly reported symptoms at the practices were nausea, headaches, eye and throat irritation, skin irritation, worsening asthma, and sleep disturbance. And all of those are very consistent with exposure, particularly to hydrogen sulfide, at the kinds of concentrations that are being measured in the council's monitoring. The other important thing, which I know that you are all very well aware of, is that there has been an effect on people's mental well-being, and that has been predominantly negative. And so patients presenting to these particular primary care practices have been reporting considerable distress, frustration, and a sense of powerlessness. Now, some of those practices are already providing support for the mental health and well-being for their patients affected by the odour using the health improvement practitioners and health coaches at those practices. We did, we made some requests with Pegasus um, help uh, to look at data from Healthline. Now, I've put this up here to show you, but it's, it's not hugely helpful. One of the things that we were, because it conflates all of the symptoms together, so this is reports of any of those symptoms, but what I just would direct your attention to on the left of the graph is that there is a clear rise in reported symptoms within the period of sort of April through May for the Christchurch area as a whole. However, um, a lot of, there has also been a concomitant rise, as I'm sure you are aware, in influenza and other illnesses which are likely to be a contributor to that. The data specifically from the Bromley area, as you can see, goes up and down. This includes data from on the left-hand side of that graph um, from, last, from late on last year. With the eye of faith, you might say that there has been some increase, but again, the numbers on the um, horizontal or the vertical axis, as you can see, are a lot smaller. But that is consistent with the kinds of reports from the wider community in terms of when these particular effects started to become a problem. The data from the Poison Centre wasn't hugely helpful. They had only had six calls in total with regard to the wastewater treatment plant. Three of those were at the time of the fire, and one of those was from someone in Wellington. Um, the, other, the other two uh, more recent reports, one was about human health effects, and it was about someone who was experiencing worsening asthma, and they were advised to see their general practitioner. The other was actually in concern about the health of pets. Um, one of the things that it's just important to understand before I go on to talk specifically about the health <coughs> register question is that 
although it might seem intuitively simple to be able to get health information down to an individual level through from general practices, is that the coding of when you visit your GP, how your encounter is coded, <coughs> doesn't necessarily give any insight into the reasons for your presentation. It's simply about the symptoms or the disease that you've been identified with. So one of the things we did ask Pegasus, for example, is would it be possible even to look at whether or not asthma rates were higher at this time than than last year. Problem with that is, aside from the difficulty of accessing the data, is that we've had an unusual two years up until now when um, viruses have been largely prevented from entering New Zealand, not just COVID. And so we've had unusually low levels of respiratory illness in the last two years, so they're not really a very good comparator for what's happening this year. So if you like, there is a kind of a perfect storm for many people this year, we have both COVID, we have COVID, we have influenza, we have other respiratory viruses, and for the people experiencing the issues with ODA, we've got that too. So, and there's quite a lot of crossover with regard to those symptoms. Now, we received on behalf of the DHB a request from Council on the 9th of June to consider a establishing a health register. In uh, considering that request, we did a number of things. We reviewed the literature about registers, particularly in relation to environmental exposures. Most of that literature refers to events such as flooding or things along those lines, which you would kind of intuitively think of as an environmental uh, disaster situation. We also sought uh, through the Ministry advice for an environmental health um, expert who has been involved in a number of situations in New Zealand, particularly dealing with contaminated sites, including Paritutu, which some of you may recognise as the site of the former Ivor Watkins Dow factory. But again, that's not so directly applicable because what was, what was being dealt with there was exposures that had happened quite some time in the past to both residents and to workers. We did attempt to identify whether there were any other similar registers anywhere else in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and the answer is that there aren't. Um, we also considered the legal requirements around the collection of and use of health information because any register that's established needs to do that um, and is subject to the Health Information Privacy Code. And it's important to recognise there that the collection of health information and the use of health information is subject to that particular legal framework. And one of the core principles around that is that um, information, if information is collected, it must be for a specific purpose. So one of the things that we inferred from Council's request was that because it wasn't specific about what the purpose of the register was, is that there might be a range of reasons why a register could be established. For example, a register could be established to attempt to um, estimate the population who are affected by a particular problem. It could be created to ensure that people had access to care who were affected or it could be for, if you like, just broadly monitoring and surveillance purposes. However, one of the things that we were very conscious of because of both the publicity and things like the um, Facebook page to a crisis is that people who are suffering from effects of the odour are actually very keen and anxious that that be acknowledged. A register is not the only way that that can be done. Similarly, a register is actually rather a, a difficult and clumsy way of ensuring that people have access to care, which is also one of the issues. There are a number of reasons, and these are only some, why a health register therefore might not be a suitable mechanism to systematically monitor the health impacts <coughs> of an exposure like the stench from the uh, damaged wastewater treatment plant in ponds. The true denominator of people who are exposed is unknown. And uh, Council will be aware from the data from the smelted app that I know you have seen before, is that people are reporting um, experiencing the odour from all over Christchurch, although the predominance of reports are in the east. But actually, we don't necessarily know um, how many people might be exposed. It's similarly also true that the numerator for anything where we're trying to look at rates would be difficult to measure. And for example, if um, registering on the registry involved a visit to a general practitioner, then it's very likely that health impacts would be underreported from them there. So the combination of those two things is also relevant in terms of many of these situations where we're dealing with an environmental exposure. One of the things you're trying to do is to find out whether people have been affected or not. 
And I think actually we already know <laughs> and we know that people are, um, are affected by this. I think the other thing that's important is that any health effects need to be interpreted in the context of baseline health status. And we know, for example, that the eastern side of the city is more socioeconomically deprived. We know it has a diverse population. And we also know that just at baseline, there is an issue with access to primary care. So a whole number of things which uh, make that particular population much more vulnerable. I think the other considerations, but they're kind of secondary, but they are real, is that it's actually far from simple to set up and maintain a health register. If you're talking about looking at long-term health effects, you could be talking about something that you have to set up which would be in place for decades. And that is in itself problematic um, in the current environment. I think the most important thing, however, as I've said before, is that a health register doesn't actually directly address people's health needs. It's at all, but it's not the only way that that could be done. So kind of in summary, in terms of our assessment of the health effects of the odour arising from the wastewater treatment plant in ponds, is that actually there is enough evidence from a number of sources, including the community itself, that people exposed to these odours are experiencing both physical and mental health effects. And that the effects are exactly and very, very consistent with what might be expected given the monitored, measured concentrations of hydrogen sulphide at the sites that have been monitored so far. And these health effects would be expected to resolve when the production of the odour is reduced back to the pre-fire levels as a result of the measures that you've already heard about being taken by the various arms of council. I think there is one qualif qualifier to that, which it's important to emphasise, is that people can become sensitised. And I don't mean allergic in this sense, it's not the same thing as an allergy, but sensitised to the effects of odour, such that they may, both, they may experience some of these health effects at very low concentrations in future. And we don't know for certain whether or not that is happening here, but it's likely that it will be for at least some people. And I'm also very cognizant of the effect, the fact that some of the people being affected currently by the odour from the wastewater treatment plant are also people who've been affected by the odours from the composting plant. So a certain amount of sensitisation would be expected in that population. So for those people, it may well be that although the health effects improve, they don't completely resolve because of that potential sensitisation. Speaking particularly for hydrogen sulphide, which is the contaminant of interest here, it's unlikely that at the concentrations measured so far that the health effects that people are experiencing are likely to persist long term, however, or that there would be different or other long term health effects from exposure. The evidence we have around the long term effects of hydrogen sulphide exposure largely comes from people who have, been exper have experienced very high exposures, but have survived, so they're not death, um, but have then continued to have other problems. Hydrogen sulphide is primarily, um, because it's a gas, the primary route of exposure for people is inhalation from in there. So that, that's, that's kind of, and again, you say you breathe in and you also breathe out, and hydrogen sulphide does not accumulate in the body. So it's when it's present, those health effects are experienced, but when it's gone, they're not at the levels that we are talking about here, as opposed to the kind of levels that might exist and might be a problem, um, as Helen has mentioned, for workers, particularly workers working in confined spaces with the gas, where because the gas is heavier than air, the concentrations can rise quite rapidly. And that can lead, unfortunately, to lethal outcomes. This is not what we are talking about in terms of um, wider community exposure. So, All right, um, thank you. So does that bring us to the end of the presentation um, from everybody? Yes. Yep, great. So now let's move to questions. Um, and it would be good um, as you ask questions, if you know whether you're directing them to, to our staff or to the um, Medical Officer of Health, um, um, or you know, if we, if we can work that out as, yeah, as we Chair, go. Yeah, I just wonder whether it would be useful um, while um, Lucy... Um, uh, at, while, there's the, while the woman's sitting here, that we have the health questions first. Why don't we do that? And That's a good idea. Thank you. Up and change. Yep. All right. So um, questions for um, Dr. Cheryl Brunton and the medical team first, 
Um, Yanni. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. It's really good to hear, you know, the, the, the work that you have been doing over assessing what's going on. I, I guess the kind of general concern that I have, and I, I'd be interested to see if there was a way forward, is, you know, if you take WorkSafe, for example, they put requirements on companies to have health monitors for people that are exposed to possible hazardous um, substances, as I understand it. They recommend 30 years for non-asbestos-related substances. Given, just at a high level, uh, I mean, I, I hear your concern around the health register, but I think people in, this, in these communities are increasingly concerned that there is a prevalence of um, health impacts because of the nature of some of the industries and because of um, what they're experiencing. Is there any other mechanism that you've considered, you know, working with the university or working with other government agencies that could be put in place to try and get a sense of what's happening at a community population level in these areas? Recognising that, of course, um, the wastewater treatment plant fire is a relatively new thing that's happened, but there's also been things like, um, you know, there's been a whole range of issues with dust, with um, quarrying is obviously one not in this area, but in other parts of the city. Um, we've had organics plant and we've had um, concrete, I think concrete um, crushing or, or, or um, that sort of industry. So, you know, is there anything that we can do to reassure the community that we can look at the population level impacts that these industries um, and types of environmental impacts are having on their health so that, you know, they can have confidence that things can be recorded and recognised going forward? Good question. Thank you. Uh, I think I will take your last point first, but also quali um, qualify that my answer is specific to the current issue with around the odour, but that in terms of recorded and acknowledged, I think one of the most important things that people can do is to see their general practitioner and to have the information about their current condition and its relationship to the odour recorded. Um, people's health records do follow them around the place, and certainly that provides us with probably one of the best sources of data. In terms of the... Um, the kind of the, the wider environment. One of the issues that we have always when looking at the population level is disentangling multiple factors in terms of the causation of any health effects they're experienced. However, what I perhaps would like to reassure you is that in terms of um, the new health service, which we'll be part of from tomorrow, is that one of the key uh, and core principles around delivery of health services is making sure that a health needs assessment is done at a population level. So, for example, the wider DHB is probably already very well aware of a number of the key factors that are having an impact on the health of people out east, but also in other parts of Christchurch and in the wider region of Canterbury. The degree to which one can fine-tune that and attribute that to any particular exposure is a huge problem and also one that in terms of the broader practice of environmental health, which is, is my field, is always difficult and tricky. And it's not that it's impossible, it's just that one of the things that we have is at the problem of relatively small numbers and rare effects because even the whole population of New Zealand isn't big enough to detect effects if they are very small because there's like five million of us. So something that occurs one in a million may be very, very difficult to detect. So I'm not in any way wanting to say anything other than that we acknowledge that there are multiple types of disadvantage that populations can experience. But I think the answer to that is much broader than the health services and is actually a collective um, effort from all engaged um, to try to improve the social and environmental conditions in which our populations live. Um, as my colleague said earlier today, that's one of the reasons we're in public health, is that we recognise that there are limitations on what health services can do, and that many of the more important determinants of health exist at a population, or whether it's a local, a regional, or a national level, and that's that's where we we tend to address our practice. So sorry, just have have we talked to like the university or the Otago Medical School about? doing some sort of outreach program looking at the, the, the impacts at a population level 
Like, is there anything, like recognizing the concerns that you've raised around the health register, Yeah. what I'm trying to understand is, is there any other thing that we can facilitate, that we can support, that we can fund? I mean, we have university students that go out and count fish in the estuary, right? Which is great. I mean, it's excellent. We've got people that are really stressed out, as you've acknowledged, with a whole bunch of symptoms that are relevant to what's going on. Is there anything that we can do? I mean, what would be, if, we, if, if you don't support a health register, is there anything that you would support that we can do to get an understanding around what's impacting on local people, short of going on Facebook, looking at social media, looking at all the self-reporting that people are doing, which, you know, has produced some quite... Um, interesting and obviously quite concerning it has indeed results. and i guess the the i would come back to what would be the purpose of the collection of that information would it tell us anything that we don't already know which is that people are suffering and that they're suffering from a number of things which they have in common and that it seems very likely that that's related to the odor in terms of the um the work that we did looking at registers population-wide surveys are an option here, but the question then becomes, what do you do with that information? How does that inform your response right. in a way that's actually helpful, as opposed to simply measuring the impact, which isn't quite the same thing. So, so that's possible. Okay. I, I guess I probably also ought to declare that I could consult myself because I work for the University of Otago as well, mm -hmm. uh, from in there as a senior lecturer in public health. But that is certainly that that is an option, but I think the issue that you would be considered there is logistical as well as who would you survey? The entire population of Christchurch? Because in the terms of the smelt it, people are experiencing, well at least reporting, experiencing both the odors and health effects for elsewhere. So I think that it's it sounds it sounds very simple to do, but actually it's much more complicated because you really want to survey the exposed population and we don't know for certain who they are. So it comes back to that same question as for the registers. So that's really, that is one of the things that could be considered uh, to be done. Um, but I think also that in terms of by the time that you would set up to do it, it might well be that a number of the problems are actually already resolved. So I guess the concern that people have is that while they understand in the short term that there will be improvements made and, mm. you know, we're all optimistic that September will, will help. They're worried that the exposure now is going to lead to long-term health impacts that we don't know. Right. And they want a, a reassurance that if there are permanent and long-term health impacts on their well-being, that that has been recorded somewhere so that there, there's a follow-up rather than just, you know, all individually having to rely on going to a GP, which, um, you know, maybe many people can't afford or, you know, there's a cost barrier. So I think that was my understanding of the request around a health register. Mm -hmm. um, and again, like we require workplaces to do it for staff that have potential exposure, as I understand it. So I guess people see that, you know, this should be treated in a similar manner. But I, I was just, into the other two questions I had, one was reducing barriers to mental health support and GPs visits. Um, what can we do to provide either free assessments or reduce the cost of GP assessments and mental health services? What's the best way that this council can support the health response to doing m more in our local community, whether it's specific clinics and areas or making access um, more widely available? Well, just to answer the first part of that, um, as I mentioned in an earlier slide, we have passed the request on to the Planning and Funding Division of the DHB, who I understand are directly in contact now with council staff to talk about the question of funding of free GP visits. I, I'll just pass over to Lucy just to talk a bit more about what's happening at the community level around, particularly around mental health support. So I agree with you, Yanni, that actually reducing the barriers for people to be able to access individual care, which will be fed into the big system, which will have the impact of, 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 of um, measuring, if possible, what the collective impact has been. That is the work that's underway. So um, as Cheryl says, we're part of the public health unit. Um, and, so, and so council does need to keep talking to planning and funding as the commissioning unit. And, uh, and council is already engaged with uh, Pegasus Health, who will provide the bulk of the um, primary care services locally. They have a whole range of... Um, 
of okay. initiatives to try and increase access, and they are focused on the east side, the final water and navigators, the uh, prime, I always get it wrong, the prim PCWs, primary yeah. care uh, workers. Um, and so that that is actively being explored, and some of it is already underway. And our, And our job is to make sure that people know that that's available, know that it will have some effect, um, and know that it will help them to understand that we do believe them. It is a horrendous situation, um, and and anything we can do to support um, is 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 crucial. Um, so 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 I agree with you. We need to make these these uh, services as accessible as possible. So sorry, sorry if, it, if it requires funding, like can can we? as a council, contribute some funding towards that? I think like, that's the conversation that's underway. Right. So when could we quantify what the cost would be I and how can how soon can we make a decision? I, I think that's the conversation that really is underway and um, I, 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 okay. I agree with you. It's really important and I think it, you know, so we we need to see whether so we can just, make it Just happen. a final question from me is, um, so one, one of the concerns in the community, and I, I don't, I, I think... I've heard you say that you're involved in looking at the test results. If you go to the commentary around the test results, and the, the latest one I can find is from like 8, 8th of June, and it just says some H2S concentrations have been measured in the ambient air downwind of CWTP exceed the OEHHA air quality criteria for potentially causing headache, nausea, and psychological responses to odour. Um, and then it goes on. However, the measured concentrations are much lower than the OE. HHA acute exposure guidelines notable uh, for notable irritation and discomfort or for more serious health effects above 41 ppm. Um, it, it's just, it's, it's virtually impossible for the community to see what the results of the air quality monitoring are and where they're exceeding or below the acceptable limits for um, whether it's the, you know, um, acute exposure or the or, or the other, um, you know, the, the, I guess the, you know, the, the lesser scale. But people, like, if you look at the testing results and the way in which they're being conveyed to the community about what's, what's an, um, you know, what levels they should be concerned about, you, you can't really see, like, if you go to the charts that are presented, you just see a bunch of numbers and lines. It's not clear which sites are are in breach or are um, above or below what levels and it's not clear to the community when things would be at a dangerous level which they might need to change you want to get to the question or alter yeah. their behavior so you know i guess um was really understanding if there's any work that you're doing around the air quality testing results around health impacts that would explain to people in very simple terms what what the levels of concern are and where um, and just related to that, one of the things that came out from the community meeting um, was around the education and what outreach is health providing to the schools around the impact on children's health. So I don't know if there's anything that you could... Well, perhaps to take the first point first around the monitoring, I think yeah, that um, one of the things that I am aware of, but um, Nigel and Helen can speak more directly to, is that there is an intention to provide more useful narrative reporting around those results, which is a bit more accessible, but it is kind of early days, as Nigel has explained, for the hydrogen sulphide monitoring, and we're talking about just a few sites. So that is certainly something that I would support because I quite agree that it's really difficult for people to understand that data. I think the council has been very transparent in putting that data there because there are people who do understand it and interpret it, but you're correct that for most people that's kind of... It's not terribly helpful. So that narrative reporting, there is already some of that on Council's website, but that's something that could definitely be improved. In terms of the education and what is happening there, I'll perhaps turn to Lucy to speak to so that. So Ministry of Education are a part of the, uh, the social response group that uh, Council convenes. Um, uh, there are some interesting initiatives. Um, well, Gary's spoken to the funding that's been made available and, and taken up. Um, uh, there are some interesting science projects that are going to come out of this, which is really important because science communication, particularly to young people, is one way of, of, of increasing reassurance and, and helping understanding. Um, in terms of uh, the health of children, again, uh, 
the best way to care for your children's health is to engage with primary care. Um, because at that individual level, parents or, or caregivers need to be able to, to look after their kids and get them the best health care possible. We haven't heard from education. We work very closely with education. Mm -hmm. And we haven't heard from them that there is... Um, that there is profound need related to this. We know that there are a lot of kids and teachers off sick because of the perfect storm that Cheryl described earlier. And, and as a parent, the concern is, uh, is how can I help my sick child, not, not in the first instance, what is causing the sickness? Mm -hmm. I think Cheryl talked earlier as well about the concentrations uh, being, uh, I'm, I'm on dodgy ground here, but, but actually people do need to respond to their own set of symptoms um, because we will all experience these levels differently. I think that was in one of Nigel's slides. Mm -hmm. And so for the people who have acutely sensitive uh, uh, sense of smell, this is hell. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we acknowledge that. All right. Thank you very much. Anne, you've got a question. Um, I think... Some of us may have been concerned when we heard a reference to asbestos in terms of long-term, um, uh, you know, effects. So, could you? Uh, what, I, what, what we've heard from you, Cheryl, is that you ex you would expect that the effects of this will diminish as the smell is dealt with. Can you just clarify again what what your thoughts are on that? Yes, I think. Um Perhaps the mention of asbestos is, is always concerning, but one of the things that we do actually have a very good understanding of the long-term health effects of asbestos exposure, which the reason for the decades is that that may present as early as, early as 20 years after exposure, but anything to 30 to 40 years afterwards. In this situation, as I've already said, this is an extraordinarily unlikely with hydrogen sulphide, because I say it is a gas, it's breathed in and breathed out, and undoubtedly causes health effects, but unless you are... Um, unless you are exposed to very high doses, suffer the toxic effects and survives, it's extremely unlikely that there will be any long-term damage. However, as I say, I qualified that by my reference to sensitisation, is that some, some people may still experience some of these effects at much lower concentrations because of that pre-sensitivity. That's not doesn't reflect kind of damage in the sense of damage to the organ. It's effect any organs of the body. It's simply a kind of retuning of the physiological responses that we all have to odour. Thank you. Celeste. Um, thank you. Um, so, I, as I understand, I mean, has, has this been treated as a, an emergency situation? And have we been kind of looking at it as a sort of a disaster response that requires looking at what the immediate needs of communities are as well as the mid and long term needs. So um, my question is, and referring to sort of things, if we look at it on a national level, one of the key learnings is about making sure that people know on a regular basis, you know, they're given as much information as possible. And even if it's not the complete picture, it's saying, we know that we've got a health crisis, this is what we're doing. And, and then that's the immediate response, and then you've got the midterm and the long-term plan. So my question is, um, in terms of immediately after the event, what was the risk health response? Was there good information provided to communities about minimising the sort of any environmental hazards, um, making sure that they've got information about keeping themselves physically and mentally healthy? And then if we look at sort of mid and long-term, is there enough information in your view to um, make sure that people understand that this response is coordinated at the right level, including the Ministry for Health, and looking at that psychosocial kind of response in the long term? Sort of, so I'm sort of asking, I guess, immediate, midterm, long term. We've kind of gone past the short term stuff, but we still need to. <laughs> well, I guess in the immediate term, uh, in terms of our public health unit's specific response to the fire itself, um, we put out advice to the public, which is the same as we would do for any fire or any large fire that's generating a lot of smoke. And that um, was put through our usual communications channels and shared through council's communications channels. 
primarily that advice is as it always is, which is to shelter in, shelter in place unless ordered to evacuate closed doors and windows, a whole lot of the standard kind of advice around fires. And that advice was um, shared and updated. Um, then there is the kind of the period of time where I think the response that you're seeking is probably not so much from us, but from the wider council is what happened in the intermediate period, because at that stage, the question of odour was not the primary concern. The primary concern for us from a public health functioning point of view is can you have a functioning sewage treatment plant, given the damage, because sewage treatment plants are actually one of the things that um, we do as a society to protect people from the hazards of our own waste and to treat those effectively. And there would have been a much bigger public health emergency and problem had the sewage treatment plant not been able to operate. In terms of recovery, or at least you know, planning in the long term, I think probably that from the point of view of the health sector, the immediate concerns had passed with that future thing. And until we were engaged by council to request further advice and support, no, I can say that there were no specific plans from the health perspective until we were engaged by council from on that. Um, but in terms of the other questions you've asked around kind of a coordinated approach and recovery, I think probably the social response group and Gary and the team are probably best placed to talk to you about that and the council's recovery plan. Here, we are very happy to be a support agency and very, very happy to um, provide advice and support to what council is doing. So you mentioned um, psychosocial. My working definition of that horrible word is it's supporting communities to um, respond uh, as well as possible in adverse circumstances. And these are clearly adverse circumstances. And it's been acknowledged that the most affected people have already lived through many, many sets of adverse circumstances. So there are many layers there. Um, we know that the, 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 the important things to support are people's sense of safety, calm, connectedness, hope, and ability to react positively, you know, have some agency. Agency is very, uh, is, is very compromised in this situation because we're all waiting for the plant to be, to be mended. Um, but there are things that can be done through, the, through brokering the sense of connection um, and, uh, and, and reassuring people that whilst it's really unpleasant, we are, we are monitoring to make sure that it is safe and we need to communicate that well. So I appreciate that this is a really messy space um, and there is no uh, silver bullet to, to, to make sure that everyone feels great in this, in this situation, but to support people to feel as good as they can and function as well as they can, that is an interagency uh, piece of work that's currently underway. Sorry, and can I just check, when, so when was that work started in terms of the interagency mm -hmm. coordination? Because if, if we treat this as a disaster, which it is, I would assume that in addition to the technical work to remove the trickling filter materials, which we, I think we've done, you know, we've been sort of communicating very transparently around that. I'm not hearing much information around the coordination around the health response, which is the bit that I think people want to also know about. Uh, well, I mean, the health response has has al always been there. Uh, you know, there has always been primary care available. There has... Um, it, it, this isn't a declared emergency, so there hasn't been the whole set of functions that that um, that would have been able to provide you minutes of those things. It, uh, and so in terms of the social response group, as far as I'm aware, it was convened in June, May. Um, uh, but 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 there has been work underway as part of people's business as usual and their businesses to respond to community needs. So there will have been that that work underway from health providers in the region in the affected area. All right, thank you very much. Now, I'm not seeing anybody else indicating questions for the medical team. And one last question, and then we need to move on. Just, um, you've, you know, you've rightly um, emphasised how distressing this is for many people, and they are in distress. But you've also talked about, um, Lucy, that, that agency, and that's about perhaps bringing some hope into a situation. Apart from that connection that you talked about, getting people together and, and talking and clear communication, what else can 
the community, what else can we do to build and engender that sense of hopefulness? Well, um, I think we're all hoping that that we maintain the deadline for the repairs and um, and and uh, or, or even um, beat that one. Um, the communications are really important, and the uh, the trustworthiness of the shared communication is really important, and we're completely committed to that, um, to playing our part in that. Um, and the communication of complex scientific facts, I agree with Yanni, those, those slides are quite intimidating. Um, but in terms of uh, brokering trust for people who have really suffered, that's not an easy fix. We just have to keep on being authentic and honest and hope that that, that is, uh, is going to grow some trust because it's, it's genuine from our part, side of the partnership. Can I just add to that, just as a sort of, I guess, a final comment? Um, so we've heard a lot of information today that we haven't heard before. Um, we will now um, really ramp up in terms of our communications on behalf of all the parties, um, um, in, including um, from Cheryl, you know, what Cheryl and, and Lucy will be um, working with us on. We will ramp up our communications around some of the health impacts um, of the odour. And as we get more data, and we can interpret it better, um, and we are doing that more work on those different thresholds or standards, we will be um, including that in our communications. All right, thank you very much. I, we do need to move on. Cheryl, um, thanks to you and your team for the work that you're doing and for joining us this morning. We appreciate it. Thanks very much indeed. Um, now we'll move to any questions of our own staff. Um, so we've got the report, which will take us red. Um, we've had the presentation. Are there any questions arising from that from our own staff? I do want to close this part of the meeting off at 11 o'clock at the very latest. Um, we've got a big agenda ahead of us. Phil. Yeah, thanks, Jane. Just just real quickly, all of the cost of these lovely people that were here, the, the extra spares, the staff time, the video, the posters, flyers, all of that is all going... To, is all being paid by insurance, it's all in a big ball of wax, is it? Um, some of the work that we're doing is actually just our business as usual, so we are just absorbing that as part of our business as usual. Um, where we can, we will be putting the cost to our insurance. Thank you. Thank you. Aaron. Thank you. Another really quick one, um, and this is when we inform ECAN about the um, test results off the offshore, do we also inform Form um, Naitahu or local iwi as well, just as part of our partnership. Uh, we're keeping in touch with Jay Hippie internally, and he's talking with uh, the local representatives, who particularly those who are interested in the estuary and that coastal area. So we do do that. Brilliant. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. One question. Microphone. On 28th of July, but I just want to know, based on following the series of questions, whether a moment even this draft not yet present to council, but whether those close agencies already, you know, each one fully understand based on the terms reference, uh, time frame, the, the, the cost, uh, etc. already have this conversation, am I right? Yes, 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 we've had that conversation. And the draft, I'm, I'm expecting to have the draft completed, hopefully, yes. by the end of this week, yes. to be able to present it to the partners and to the um, community panel early next week. Um, and then once that's done, I'll be back. Um, hopefully the next briefing of the week after, I'll be here with it for you. So just to be clear, the 28th is the next formal meeting of the council, council. and that's what we will formally bring you the, um, the plan. But we will brief councillors and let councillors um, sort of you know, work with the plan, draft plan before then. Thank you. Great, thank you. Celeste. So can I just clarify, is it the, on the 28th, is that when you're coming to report back about that out-of-zone review? Yes, yep. So that's approximately a month from now? Yes, that's right. So, because we're aware that the majority of the smells coming from lots of ash and ponds, and that's actually changed the, I guess, the range of areas that are impacted by the source of the odour. Are there things that we're going to be putting in place to address immediate need? It's sort of a question that's been asked, but in terms of that out of zone support. So we know that the source of the odour has shifted. 
say the wind direction also changes over different periods of time. So we know that pe perhaps some of the other areas adjacent to the ponds are suffering impacts now, but we're waiting a month to report back on reviewing the out of zone support. Yeah, so the out of zone package that I have, yeah. um, remembering that the large amount of that is for the, um, the immediately affected within the zone. So while I'm running at 69% of acceptance there, um, we do have to monitor the, the out of zone. I get, I do understand what you're asking though, because of the weather changing and everything, would we look at now looking at those people differently? Yes, we would. Okay, uh, and sorry, I'll just quickly have a couple more. Um, so we know the property report's coming back in about two weeks, is that right, roughly speaking? And we'll go back to residents who have got questions about that. Yes, yes. Yep, um, and then, uh, just quickly, you might have explained this already, but in terms of the, a noticeable reduction in the smell from the oxidation ponds, which is, is that September? The, we should see a, a reduction in the smell from the oxidation ponds earlier than September. Uh, and so that relies on, first of all, establishing that biological treatment and then flushing the water through the oxidation ponds. However, we, we need to keep in mind that the, um, the areas infected, affected by the odours and the degree of that is very much dependent on the weather conditions. So at the moment, we've got that, this cold, very still weather, um, and so the odour isn't being swept away as it was earlier in the year when it was windy. So that's part of the reason why it's pretty difficult at the moment. So yes, the ponds are in poor condition, and the weather conditions are working against us with those still conditions. So as we move through the next um, few weeks, we will see an improvement. However, it'll be up and down for different parts of the neighbourhood depending on those, um, on those winds as well as the, the improvements in the ponds. And I think the other thing that we need to keep in mind is, as Cheryl Brunton was talking about, and as we showed on that slide about um, odour thresholds and people being upset, some people are very sensitive to these odours. Um, and so even as the ponds start to improve, they will not notice that improvement. Um, other people who are less sensitive probably will. So, you know, if you take, if you take five people, say I take Sam down to, um, to Councillor Chen, um, at that odour threshold of the 30 parts per billion or 0.03 parts per million, we're saying that 83% of people or the Californian Office of um, Environmental Health are saying that 83% of people will smell it. So, um, you know, Councillor MacDonald down to Councillor Johansson will smell it and um, Councillor Chen won't. He won't notice it at all. Um, and then there's the 40% who are very badly affected at that level. So they don't just notice it, they get symptoms. Um, so Councillor MacDonald and Councillor Chu are saying, this is disgusting, I've got headaches, nausea, and these other three are saying, I can smell it, but it's okay. So you've got that, you've got that big range of response in the community, and the people on the sensitive end, such as Councillor MacDonald, are still going to be complaining. Smell. Yeah. <laughs> just to be clear. Just about the smell. So we've got, yeah. we've, we're dealing with, um, not only are we dealing with biological processes and slow changes that are affected by the weather, we're dealing with a diverse community and some very sensitive um, receivers, if you like. So some people are affected a lot more than others. And it would be correct to say that some people are more affected because they've been had repeated exposure. So I might have a different sensitivity to say to Sarah. That, no, that I'm also more sensitive because I... According to the Ministry for the Environment, they say that repeat exposure to low levels of vote can create a heightened sensitivity. That's on top. That's on top. So that's, so that's just thing. for a general population, that, that, um, that work that's done on sensitivity. And that's just about how acute your own sense of smell is for that particular range of compounds. Um, Thank you. So Thank you. Um, now, Yanni, I'll come to you for one, for one quick question, because we are just about out of time. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I've got a lot of questions, so I'll just try and find one. Um, but, um, you know, I mean, this is such a significant issue in our community. Um, I, I think maybe we can get a briefing maybe next week and look at, I mean, because obviously you don't, you don't want to spend the time. Well, we, we don't have the time. We've, we've right. spent almost an hour and a half on this this morning already. Um, okay. I would love to have the luxury of time, but we've got a full agenda ahead of us. So if we can just take one question and then let's take offline how we deal with any other outstanding matters that you've got. 
Right. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah. Okay. Um, so, I, I mean, I think what's apparent is that people want to see us do more. So we've heard um, the the painting analysis. Um, we've heard you know people should go see a GP if they're concerned. I, I, I just kind of wanted to understand like rather than wait to the end of the month, are there practical things that we could do now, like helping people clean up the, the black stuff um, or um, helping people do assessments of what the best thing is, you know, air purifiers, um, et cetera, for their own individual circumstances or provide um, the access to the GPs and the mental health. And I appreciate we've heard today that um, there's going to be a funding discussion, but you know, could we look at something in the short term, like Celeste has raised, um, like could we fund a clinic at the Bromley Community Centre for you know two hours or three hours a week um, to just get some immediate support while those longer term things are done? That I mean, it's really just a question of what's the immediate practical help and support that we could give people given that we've previously heard that money isn't an object to stopping us doing anything that we need to do in terms of the response. So if we can get a quick answer to that question and then let's refer the other matters, Yanni, that you've clearly got to a workshop or a briefing that we can, we can hold once we've looked at what the subjects of that briefing or workshop need to be, which may well be based around some of these issues that you've got. But if we can just get a quick answer to that question and then we need to close off this yeah. part of the meeting. So if there's anything that we can do or our partners can do, um, and it's and we've agreed that it's actually going to add value, then we will be doing it. Um, if there is a financial um, implication for what we might want to do, um, we may have to come back and get a formal decision of this council. So um, we will be looking at all our options. Um, we are working effectively with our partners. It won't be us delivering everything, um, and that's why we've got our partners on board with us. Um, we will be definitely looking to progress anything that we can that's going to improve the, um, the well-being of that community that's most affected. Um, and if there is a financial issue, we will think about how we might manage that. And if there's something really urgent, then we, we will look at potentially bringing it back to an a, um, unprogrammed council meeting. But we know that there's a meeting on the 28th, and that's the date that we are sort of looking at in terms of getting a, any big decisions made around financial decisions that staff don't have delegation for. Well, I will speak to health after this around that exact idea, Councillor Johansson, and if we can do it, we'll do it. All right, so let's consider outside of what we're doing today, a briefing or a workshop where we can consider any outstanding matters or relevant matters. Um, let's take that conversation outside of this meeting, but actively um, consider how we might best use some, some additional time. All right, that's great. So thanks very much indeed to staff and to the medical team for the report and for the presentation and answers to questions this morning. Um, that brings us to um, three minutes past 11. What I'm going to do now is to adjourn for morning tea, but just until 11.15 um, when we've got venues Otatahi joining us. So it's going to be a shortened morning tea break this morning again in the interest of time. Back here at 11.15 with venues Otatahi. Thank you.
And call the meeting back to order, please. We'll reconvene. So the next part of the meeting is running through the quarterly reports. So quarterly reports from venues Otatahi, and then Sam will come into the chair for the quarterly reports from Christchurch NZ Holdings and from Christchurch City Holdings. Um, and then we will move into the public excluded part of the agenda um, once we have heard from CCHL. So um, first of all, item 12, venues Otatahi. Um, so Caroline, welcome to the table with your team. And we've got Linda Gibb from our own staff as well. Um, and Susan Goodfellow, newly appointed director to Venues Otatahi, um, a particularly warm welcome to you coming into this meeting and to the chamber for the first time. So welcome. Um, good to have you with us. And I invite you to present the um, quarterly report. Thank you. Oh, well, good morning. Nice to see you all again. Um, nice to be talking a little bit about Venues Autotahi um, and reflecting on the Q3 report in the period between um, January and end of March. Um, so look, I'll just cover off a few kind of key points that you will have already uh, seen in the report and then um, take any questions. Um, so look, the, what feels like a lifetime ago, the first quarter of this year, third quarter of the financial, uh, COVID-19 obviously continued to challenge the business. Um, with the exception of the last couple of weeks in March, we were in red traffic light settings for the entire period uh, in those first couple of weeks in January. Uh, and that meant that uh, any indoor events uh, over 100 couldn't proceed. Uh, and with the majority of venues, Autotahi events being larger events, that pretty much meant that we were predominantly out of action. Uh, so in summary for that period, about 30% of our events proceeded, either um, under restrictions or as planned. We had 45% of our events postponed, and the remainder of 25% cancelled. Um, included in those that did go ahead, uh, however, under restriction, we did have a couple of... Uh, couple of matches at Hagley Over, which was awesome, a couple of the Women's Cricket World Cup matches, uh, as well as a Black Caps South Africa test, um, but obviously all of those were under, under restrictions. Um, and as we moved through the red traffic light setting, we again put in place a, a, a VO COVID-19 response and recovery strategy. Uh, we've been there a couple of times before. Uh, and a lot of that, uh, essentially, the foundations were already set because we'd made such transformational changes to the business over the last couple of years. Um, but essentially what we did uh, with immediate effect was all of our permanent staff diverted to where our casual staff would normally be uh, in action. That included delivering the vaccination clinic at Christchurch Arena. Obviously, any recruitment went on hold uh, and any roles vacated uh, were left vacant. Uh, we put in place an Easter close down uh, and we also reduced uh, any services that were in place, any services that we could terminate or suspend for the period. Uh, what we also looked to do was um, utilise our commercial kitchens and our staff where we could support other entities around the region who were planning for isolation periods uh, where they needed to continue to deliver some of those essential services. So things like schools and universities, um, care facilities, uh, where we could potentially support those kitchens uh, to continue to deliver. Uh, we put that in place as well. Uh, and that'll actually be something we'll continue to do if ever challenged with this sort of thing again. Look, in terms of financial impact, obviously it was significant. Um, so we had an $800,000 negative impact on our event revenues. Uh, year to date uh, at that point in time was $3.9 million. Um, but that was offset by $700,000 worth of lower expenses over the period. Uh, and year to date, $2.3 million. Um, so in summary, in light of those transformational changes we made back in mid-2020, we had a really strong start to the financial year this year. Um, we put in place, obviously, that response and recovery strategy, uh, and we did have the support of central government in the latter half of 2021 by way of the employer wage subsidy, which we didn't have for the first quarter of uh, 2022. Uh, so we actually delivered an EBITDA above budget um, of 368000 uh, which is 246000 ahead of budget. Um, and look, in circumstances uh, that you would not normally expect, uh, we are forecasting a surplus EBITDA by year end, which is the first time in over 10 years. So 
um, we're pretty happy about that under the circumstances. Um, and I would just like to take this opportunity to, to acknowledge the venue's Ototahi team. It's been a really challenging couple of years uh, and they have responded with absolute integrity and grace and uh, have really supported each other and have gone over and above to really do what it takes to get us through what has been a really challenging time. Um, but further afield, and I know it's not covered necessarily in our quarterly, but looking forward, the outlook for 22-23 is really, really positive. Uh, we've got a really strong event forecast, particularly around ticketed events. Uh, and we're really expecting to see about a $30, $30 million economic uh, benefit to the region of those events. And this is in addition to the $2 million worth of forecast direct economic contribution from our local food and beverage strategy. So in summary, despite the challenges that have been, uh, we are looking like a really, a really bright future. Um, we're going to continue to focus on celebrating and sourcing local. We're going to focus on sustainability and the environment, uh, accessibility and inclusivity, uh, and continuing to deepen our connection with our cultural heritage. Um, we're going to continue to focus on bringing those events in that deliver the most economic benefit to the region, as well as the social and cultural benefit to the region. Uh, and as always, we remain committed to our relationship with our shareholder and navigating our way through what will always be an inevitable challenge in the future. Uh, but we will continue to get stronger, we'll continue to, get, continue to focus on being better and more resilient as we head into the future. Thank you. Great. So thank you for the report and for that presentation and congratulations on the results that you've presented, um, which have been achieved in what are still very unusual and extremely challenging circumstances. So the period that we're talking about obviously was you know, subject to some very unusual situations. The results that you've described are, are outstanding, um, particularly in those circumstances. Thank so you. thank you for that. Now just um, coming to your comments around you know, the events sector obviously picking up pace and some, some very healthy forecasts. Are you really seeing a lot of confidence come back in um, events? And, and are you also seeing postponed events playing into that space and perhaps some pent up demand playing out as well? Yeah, a little bit of that. So I think um, with corporate events, you see a little bit more of a lag. You know, um, there's only so many times you want to cancel and rebook and cancel and rebook. So, uh, but that is certainly starting to build up. And we've seen some magnificent events in the town hall in the last few weeks with Itipu and the opening of Meetings 2022. So really seeing a lot of activity. And actually the um, Meetings 2022 event uh you know, you're seeing a lot of enthusiasm for Autotahi Christchurch, a lot of enthusiasm for bringing events here, which is fantastic, and that's business events. Um, but we really are seeing quite a surge in ticketed events activity. A lot of artists, they need to tour, they need to make money, uh, and there's been some pent-up demand. Uh, but you've, we've got to balance that with, um, you know, only so many people will buy so many tickets per year, so we've just got to make sure that we're, we are accepting the events that will continue to sell uh, and deliver what they need to. Yeah, after what we've been through, it's great to be able to get to that more positive forecasting in that more positive space, though. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Move. Sam will move. Yeah. Um, Yanni, you're seconding, or you've got a question? I had a, had a question. Just, All right. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's been raised before, but are, are we able to get a sense of the performance of each of the venues and how much we're subsidising each one? Uh, so we're obviously a portfolio approach. Um, the subsidy that um, the council provides to venues Autotahi wholly and solely goes to the R&M uh, and asset, uh, the fixed costs associated with the assets, and that is the Christchurch Arena, the Christchurch Town Hall, uh, and Orange Theory Stadium. So uh, not Hagley Oval and not the Air Force Museum. So we wouldn't report on individual venues. Right. It's just previously in the past there's been concern raised around the high cost of operation of some of the venues. And so when we just look at it at a group level, we don't get a sense of which ones uh, are concerned. How, how would we do that? Well, I guess each of the venues will always have different aspects to them. You know, the town hall will have higher operational costs. It's, it's larger, it's more complex, it has heritage um, aspects to it. Uh, the Christchurch Arena will be used in peaks and troughs. So it's quite hard to really, uh, and, and to see what value that would really give us, I guess from reporting on those things individually. 
Right. And I think we've got to think of our job as governors, which is to, and as the shareholder, which is to look at the overall performance of the business. And in, in the context of the quarterly reporting, to track that against the budget and the statement of intent targets and, and so on. Mm. Um, you know, there's a level of detail that's right for your board to go into, which our monitoring role sits somewhat above that. Mm. Mm. Yeah, just, um, I guess, just interesting in the Hagley Oval. Do you do you attract events to that? Is that one of your functions? And do you know if there's when we originally agreed um, as a council for that oval to go ahead, it was discussed that there would be non-sporting type entertainment recreation type events there. Do you know if there's any work going on around around that? So uh, so with major events at Hagley Oval, we obviously partner with Christchurch NZ and, and the council as well about attracting those events. And we've got a really good, uh, obviously, cricket schedule. Uh, the pavilion itself, we do uh, look to attract other types of events, so uh, weddings, etc. Uh, sometimes a challenge with uh, we get cricket um, draws quite quite late in the year. So obviously when people plan a wedding, they'd like to be able to lock those dates in a little sooner. Uh, in terms of use of actually Hagley Oval for an alternative event like a concert or something like that, for example. Um, there are a limited number of days that we are allowed under the under the district plan, I believe, which is um, how many days of the year we're actually allowed to utilise the Oval. Um, but we have been talking to council about an annual um, concert maybe at yeah. Hagley Oval. It just yeah. seems crazy we've got all that facilities there and yet we, people pay a whole bunch of extra to bring stuff under Hagley Park when there's a venue there that could possibly be, be used and yeah. save costs. And it's a beautiful cool. venue. Um, cool. We just have to be careful around, uh, obviously, the turf as well. And yeah. how we... Thank you. And thank you for, just to acknowledge what they're doing around the, the buy local. I think a number of us who went to the town hall um, last last week was pretty impressive to see what the progress that you're making in that space and your continued commitment to looking at improving it as well. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not seeing anybody else signaling questions. I'm, so I'm this is moved by them. Sam, seconded by um, Leanne. Um, is there any discussion? All those in favour say aye. aye. Against, that's carried. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. So um, just noting that Tim Skander sat back from that one. So now, Sam, I'll invite you to take the chair for Christchurch NZ and CCHL and then to take us into um, public excluded. Thank you. Welcome along. We're in your hands, so I think they gave you a bit of a time limit to go through, and then um, we'll go to questions. <laughs> Kia ora koutou. Yes, thanks, Sam. Um, thanks for the opportunity to to meet with you today. Um, I think it's fair to say Ali and I have done a bit of COVID tag teaming over the last month, so um, it's Ali's first day out in the real world again. So. We are exceptionally happy to be here in person. Um, and I know that time is tight, so I won't say anything except to say that we're, I'm really confident in the work that Christchurch NZ is doing and the impact it's having at a really challenging time for many people. And um, Ali is going to walk you through, and I'm taking from Sam Steer, perhaps a slightly edited version of our presentation, but over to Ali. Fantastic. Thank you. And it is lovely to be here in person. So look, um, uh, the value of 44.5% higher between January and March than in the same period of last year, 2021. And in the last quarter, we've had two record breaking months of consents. And online employment listings also still reached a record high. So from an economic overview, um, we are continuing to live in challenging times. So the COVID pandemic, as I have experienced firsthand, still affecting markets and the global economy. Um, and a troubled international geopolitical landscape um, is having a continuing impact on global trade and particularly on supply chains. I think it's worth mentioning the cost of living and inflation in particular. It's become the main talking point. It certainly um, uh, was a large topic at our uh, Economic Insights Breakfast with um, industries this morning. Um, and that's fueled in part by a 30-year, um, so it, it's actually a 30-year high. It's a, almost just under 7%. Um, uh, and labour supply shortages continue to be a big challenge that a lot of our businesses are, are, are facing. So that's just a really brief overview of the economic landscape. 
Um, I thought I'd just very quickly touch on this. This is not something that is retrospective, but I think it's important that, that, that you are aware of it. Um, Greater Christchurch 2050 and our uh, letter of expectation um, uh, has asked us as an agency to pursue three key areas of work. The first two, the development of a place brand strategy and the development of two destination plans, uh, destination management plans one for Greater Christchurch and one for Banks Peninsula. They're being developed together using a single RFP process. We've received funding from MB to cover the destination management plans. Um, and the RFP for that work has now closed and we're in the vendor selection stage. So um, look, we're only gonna be able to deliver great results with fantastic um, stakeholder consultation and input. So that's already started for the third piece of work, which is our economic development strategy for the city. Um, but we'll be um, coming to you to consult about the place brand and destination management plans in due course. Um, I want to split our um, visitation and attraction into domestic and international. So we've continued to focus on attracting domestic businesses, migrants and visitors to the city as the border restrictions remained in place for much of the quarter. In the domestic visitor attraction area, one upcoming campaign I just wanted to share is part of our COVID recovery work. So Neat Places have been commissioned to deliver a campaign to drive visitation to the central city during August, and it's called Turn Up the Heat. It's a, a month of... Um, quite a lot of activity and we've been collaborating with Bruce Rendell and the team here at the council on this so it's going to be delivered in um, partnership with Hospitality NZ, the Central City Business Association and the Property Council. So look out for that in August. From an international perspective, um, it's fantastic that we've been able to get back out into the world again and we have a partnership with Tourism NZ to promote Christchurch and surrounding regions in the east coast of Australia. Um, we're also investing in research from Kia to help us understand expat Kiwi's interest in Christchurch for business and migration. That comes back to that skills shortage that I referenced earlier. Um, so I'll leave it there rather than go into too much detail on that given the time pressure. Um, I did want to talk a little bit uh, more detail about business support. So um, I'm thrilled to announce that Christchurch NZ, in partnership with the Employers Chamber of Commerce, was successful in again winning the Regional Business Partners contract. Um, and the existing RBP program is on track with capability funding, business mentor matches and NPS all well above target. We continue to lead the way nationally there. This quarter, we also agreed with MB to facilitate delivery of their Digital Boost program. Um, that's the skills training program for small to medium businesses, which is going to be oper operationalized in quarter four. From an innovation perspective, startup success continues. Uh, businesses like MenuAid have raised close to a million dollars in venture capital funding. Um, and we have a strong pipeline thanks to our cluster challenges, which took place last week. Um, I was really disappointed that COVID prevent, present, prevented me from speaking. Obviously, I still can't speak <laughs> at the Food, Fibre and Agritech Challenge and the Aerospace Challenge. Uh, but I heard they both went really well um, uh, uh, with 24 strong accelerator participants whittled down to 12 fi finalists in the Food, Fibre and Agritech Challenge. Many of those will now head on to the incubators in our innovation ecosystem. I do want to talk a little bit about skills a little bit more. And as I said, we had a, 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 an insights breakfast this morning that focused very much on this. And this is the number one challenge facing cities businesses at the moment. So uh, in the short term, we mounted an advocacy campaign last quarter using a report that we produced and promoted to officials and politicians. We recruited and prepped industry spokespeople, people like Ben from Hamilton Jet, to talk to media, and that resulted in really good media pickup, but as of yet, no response to government. We have sent it to the um, incoming immigration minister and still hope to get a result there. In the medium term, um, we've designed our Women in Work campaign, which has been branded Power Up, and that's uh, basically looking to connect the nearly 20,000 underutilized and underemployed women in Canterbury with employment. We engage with over 30 different um, stakeholder agencies and businesses, plus several focus groups of women to design the campaign, and that launches next week. Antarctic Office, um, just basically to say that um, uh, we've really enjoyed being part of the Tirama Mai event, which is on at the moment, and the Days of Ice Festival, which is Christchurch's public celebration, is being planned uh, to coincide with the beginning of the next Antarctic season in September and October. Screen Canterbury, uh, we recently had a booth at the Cannes uh, Film Festival, which doubles as the world's biggest trade show for screen production. There's actually a screen production being filmed in town today, for those of you who, who haven't seen it yet. And we received 12 production inquiries from Cannes. We've invested alongside the University of Canterbury and the New Zealand Film Co 
Commission in the Waitaha Creative Incubator to support this. And the Screen um, Canterbury NZ production grant will be reopened in June to continue the pipeline of screen opportunities. Urban development. This quarter marked a significant milestone in progressing our move towards becoming an extended EDA. Um, at Christchurch NZ and Council staff work together to develop a prioritisation framework for urban development projects and a capital strategy, uh, which was approved by the FMP committee. Work continues with multiple parties to finalise the subdivision and transform Milton Street from a contractor's yard to a mixed-use commercial and residential development. And good progress continues to be made on the residential development phase of the new Brighton Regeneration Project, with the Beresford development sites going unconditional and further stages of the Seaview development being brought forward. And we've worked with Neat Places to launch a marketing campaign in New Brighton that will see eight videos rolled out of local legends attracting more visitors to the area. For our major events portfolio, Caroline and Venus Otatahi just talked a little bit about uh, the Women's Cricket World Cup. Um, and I thought I'd just share a few um, results from that. Um, we did a, a, a piece of work with Fresh Info to review the economic impact. We had five games in Christchurch, including the semi-final and final. Um, and I'm pleased to sort of share that the results are pretty amazing. Um, just under 7,000 people attended the event. We were lucky that we were towards the tail end of the event when some of the restrictions were lifted. Corporate hospitality was sold out with strong demand. We got 8,500 visitor nights in the region generated by the event and around $740,000 of tourism expenditure. The cost benefit return to the region was 1.35, and the net benefit to our city was 2.3 million, which includes all of the measured social and economic costs and benefits of hosting the event. And that doesn't even count the community benefits such as satisfaction, net promoters, and resident pride, which were really well above average, and it reflected a really timely positive boost to Christchurch. Um, again, Caroline mentioned Meetings 22, which took place a couple of weeks ago, and our business um, events team actually started to build up towards meetings by visiting the Asia-Pacific Inventives Incentives and Meetings event, which is known as AIM, in Australia in quarter three. Um, it's one of a global suite of trade shows for the business events industry, and it's the Asia-Pacific equivalent of, of meetings. And I hope you all saw how vibrant the city was when meetings was in town. It really was fantastic to get that buzz. At AIM, we secured hot leads for events that would inject $11 million into our city's um, economy. And then just a couple more slides. Just moving on to our financial performance. Delivery continues to be impacted by COVID during the quarter. Underspending activity co cost is most notable in our destination and attraction area due to the postponement or cancellation of major and business events such as Sale GP, which has been moved to next year. I should also note that nearly half of our revenue for the quarter is from sources other than council, and that relates to COVID recovery, a lot of its central government tagged funding. Um, borders opening combined with expenditure of business support will see an increase in spend in the final quarter, but we will see a significant portion of central government funding transferred into the new financial year. And then finally, um, our um, uh, levels of service. So levels of service are mostly on track with strong performance in support for businesses, bids to attract business events to Christchurch and screen inquiries. Our ability to deliver a major event seed fund, use of our narrative assets and development of a new destination product um, have all been impacted by COVID and they're not expected to recover by year end. Thanks for the opportunity to share. I'm going to leave it there. Hopefully I rattled through that at pace. <laughs> so, um, uh, and we're really happy to take any questions that you've got. Thank you um, very much. I mean, that, that was really useful. And while I do appreciate you speed through it, I think you've covered the key points really, really well. So um, you don't don't feel like we're rushing you through in that sense. And it is great. We I do appreciate both the Chief Exec and the Board Chair coming in for this. It is, it is really, I know how busy both are, so I appreciate that. Does anyone have any questions? Aaron, Jimmy. Uh, so Aaron first. Yeah, thanks for that. And it was uh, not um, very concise. A couple of quick questions. One is um, the event, Turn Up the Heat. Um, the image, is that flames? Hmm. It is flames in the image. Okay. Yeah, um, flames. Sorry? Flames. Yeah. Well, that's what it did look like. I was just double checking. But because when you read the um, description of the event, it kind of seems slightly different to flames. And I just thought flames can be a little bit negative given the Port Hills fires and also the whole thing mm -hmm. with um, Turn Up the Heat being an event name. And as a planet, we're meant to be turning down the heat. So I. When I first saw it, it was a little triggering, and I thought, I'm just going to ask the question. So I thought, there, there you go. There. I'm not a lot of agreements around the table. 
but um, yeah, uh, a good food shop. Aaron, would I'm just conscious of time. So. <laughs> well, I just it's consideration of name scene. Um, if you've put a, a, a bad name to an event, your event might yeah. not be that successful. No, I good, could name others, but we haven't got all. As day. Ellie has always said, you can pass your feedback through via email as well at any time. So yeah, not my thing. And then the other one is um, the Screen Canterbury, the grants. That have gone into the uh, that have brought the productions to town. Fantastic! I did have someone ask me the other day uh, to ask the question around: um, is the, is that now locked in for an amount of time, and does the funding for that stay is that separate, or does the money for those grants get used to fund the screen office? Um, so um, the funding that we allocated towards screen grants. So is the majority of that will go towards grants. There are some that is to, to do with the back, back office administration costs of, de, of delivering that. So, But we have essentially closed the fund for this year. We were oversubscribed and we ended up um, basically allocating what we can. But it does take quite a long time for some of those to come through. So they don't always actually materialise as quickly as perhaps we thought. Uh, we are opening the, um, the, the grant again at the beginning of this year and we expect to have a positive interest in that again but some of it comes and covers our administration overheads yeah but yeah. As, as little as we can yeah. we want the majority of it to be out there actually attracting people um, absolutely and it'd yeah. be good to um for elected members to see uh, a, a really clear update of which ones did get here and and what they ended up being because that's the easy way to continue the funding is to see the success whereas yeah. if it's not subscribed no one turns up no one films what's the point but I know that it's been good so that yeah, would great. be great thank you yeah that's useful thank you Jimmy okay, quickly one question thank you for the report because in uh, March of this year council we uh, approved the prioritized international partners particular regarding to the, uh, the follow all the international relations policy framework but quite your aim is one of key stakeholders you know today I didn't Hear about it, how do we to integrate our resources, focus on those uh, prioritize USA, Australia, Korea, and China. I didn't hear about it, particularly regarding to the tourism and education or investment, etc. Yeah. Um, thanks for the question. Look, we're really excited about the international framework. We think it's a really, really great message and the fact that we're focusing. Um, as a city, I think that that's been well received. We are working closely. I've spent um, quite a lot of time with the um, Consul General of China in the last quarter talking about what we can do. And I know that she is very proactively helping build relationships with our, um, our China focus area. Uh, we are limited by budget. So, and we're also limited by the fact that um, uh, there are some parts of the world that are still restricted in terms of uh, where we can go and what we can do. But we are going to be very targeted in where we focus our international energy. We just can't afford to have a scattergun approach. We've got to take that international framework and build on it. So we, we are big believers in it. It's just that we're a bit limited in terms of funds and timing at the moment. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Great. Thank you. Uh, Yanni. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you for the work that you're doing. Just, yeah, I mean, I guess I just do share Councillor Kieran's concern. Um, just in terms of the campaigns that you've got, though, the place brand strategy that you're looking at, um, are, are you using local creative sector? Like, is can we just get some understanding of who you're using in that space, and that you are looking to use local producers? So, so you, um, uh, local providers forms part of the criteria for our RFP process. So. Um, uh, there are some areas where the skill set may not be available locally, but it is a very important part of our criteria when we're assessing which provider to go with. I haven't actually been involved in that RFP process, and I don't actually know the outcome of it yet. Yeah. So, But I have asked exactly the same question, and I know it's a very important contributing factor in the decisions that we make. There will definitely be a local element to it. I don't know that it'll be completely local. Yeah, and do you have a sense of... Um what's happening in the um, space around the sort of gaming sector. I know that you've, you've talked about, I think, um, one sort of company, the Granary, but yep. I know that there was also a kind of joint up collaborative engagement process that was happening, but I'm just not sure where the next steps have got to and whether there's anything that we need to be thinking about. 
So we do have a gaming strategy that was built as part of the Screen Canterbury um, program. Um, I think it's an area that um, we need to re-look at and re-energize because to me it's a really big opportunity. So it's actually a very live and relevant question, um, Yanni, that I'm looking at myself at the moment. And part of that will be when we replace our um, GM for uh, innovation and business growth, which is currently a live recruitment process, then um, then that person will be able to lean into how we can how we can leverage that more. I think it's a real opportunity. Right. Is, uh, but just is there an ongoing sort of program of work? There's a there's a strategic framework, but I would be uh, I I don't think we're leaning into it as much as we can and should. It has it has not had as much focus as I would like to give it. Okay, cool. So yeah, I mean to increase that. Um, cool. Um, and just the the only other thing. Um, in terms of like the summer campaign or the neat places campaign, um, h- how are you measuring like the impact? Like I see with the summer program, you know, you talk about um, the number of clicks, the number of views, um, the impressions, the, the link clicks and the unique summer page views. H- have, have you been able to work out like, you know the cost of the campaign versus the value that you've got back, and how um, do you how do you do that? Short of just, I guess, the kind of normal web figures that we get. You know, is there a way to look at the tangible impact for local attractions, for example? From it, the- it is very difficult. Um, who I can't remember who famously said that fifty percent of marketing is wasted if only you knew which fifty percent. And and <laughs> and 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 that's ab- absolutely true. It is very difficult. But I might just actually ask Tracy to comment on that if you're. Um, yeah. So Tracy Tracy Wilson is our GM for destination and attraction, and okay. um, uh, I just she'll she'll give you a much um, better answer than I am able to. Right. Um, caveat in that I wasn't with the organisation then, but I have reviewed the data and marketing is my background. Actually, that campaign, Yanni, was actually one of the cheapest spends for the highest return of the clicks. So actually, that one was a very good return on investment. Um, but I think your point about actual visitation, shop numbers, etc., that's some really important work. And I, I might just comment on um, turn up the heat. Obviously, in winter, we all like to get a little bit warmer. And that campaign has some really clear metrics about um, foot traffic as well as um, spend, as we talked about in our economic update this morning. It's not just foot traffic. Um, it's foot traffic, sorry, that we need because actually the dollars are going up. That's inflation. It's actually not the number of transactions. So we've put some key metrics in place for that campaign that I do look forward to being able to update because I think you're absolutely right. We need more measures than just clicks on websites. Great. Yeah, okay. I think we're, uh, Celeste? Kia ora and um, welcome back. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm specifically just wanting to talk about, and you might not have a lot of details, so just ask a question around the new Brighton Regeneration Project, and they've done neat places and done some other things. And, um, you know, it's, it's really awesome, some of the things that have been happening. And, um, you know, I'm really great to showcase some of the local legends and some of the other work that's underway. So my question is, um, in terms of identifying kind of the community uh, stakeholders that can be engaged in that process in terms of guiding the work that's being done on the ground. I know staff are doing a great job because I've been um, liaising with them quite a bit, but is there kind of a more of a structured process around that in terms of uh, making sure that we uh, don't sort of deliver placemaking projects based upon what we think is best, but also based upon what the direction is from the community and businesses and so forth? Is, is there a sort of a a way that we can get a bit more information about that? Um, So I don't have a direct answer to your question, but I think the point you raise is absolutely relevant. And it's true for the destination management plan as well, whether it's placemaking or destination management or whatever it is we're building. It has to be something that the community believe in and buy into and feels authentic for them. And and so I've often said to, to, to my team, uh, spend 80% of your time on a project through consultation and talking to people and understanding because actually people have to believe that A, there's a need to do it and B, that we're the right agency to help deliver that. And when we've got the buy-in to that, then actually we can we, we, we can take people on that journey. So I, I don't know the specific question from placemaking and I will take a, an action to follow up on it, but I think your point is right in anything that we do. The last thing we want to do is look like we're kind of helicoptering in as the kind of rescuing agency. That's not our aim at all. Great. I think Phil has a question. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you. How, how many people did we send to Khan? Uh, well, uh, uh, one. Yeah, 
Just our Screen Office representative. Okay. And I, I understand, are we, is, is Screen Canterbury starting to merge, I'd say, with UC Canterbury, with their um, new um, studios that are going to get it's, built in? It's that not goes? merging, but that was very much a joint trip. They went together and presented together and worked together and did everything as a team. So we went as a Christchurch kind of representation. No worries. Thank you. I think Yanni has another question. Just Sorry, just one really quick question, because um, it's great that we're doing work around the film and the gaming. Um, I was just interested, like we've got as a council the Go Live local music, and I just wondered, is there anything you're doing in this space to support local musicians in terms of economic development and developing the culture sector? Because it seems to me that, yeah, it's it's something that Christchurch has, you know, got a lot of bands and... Um, has in the past, you know, many years ago, CDC used to look at that sort of stuff. Is there any? I think the short answer is, is is no. Right. <clears throat> Sorry, apologies. Um, uh, there are lots of opportunities everywhere we look, whether it's different international countries that we could attract or different industries or verticals that we could work with. Um, and the challenge we have as an agency is we're spread very thin. So our fifteen point nine million dollars is is fixed, and um, and 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 we have a lot to deliver already within our remit. My fear is that we're actually already doing too many things, um, and we need to actually do fewer things and do them well. So um, whilst I absolutely agree with you, it's a fantastic opportunity, and I, and I I think it could be great. We've got to make some choices about where we want to play, and that's obviously going to be guided by conversations with you as our um, right. shareholder. So the key thing is, if we wanted you to do that work, we would identify it and fund it, and then ask you to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks. I think we're there now. I, I just had um, one, and it's not a question, but just a takeaway, and it's in our report Linda's pulled together, just around 2.9 and 2.10, just around the reporting metrics and the value. It says it's difficult to measure specific interventions in the short term. I mean, I guess the challenge to put to you is, can we go away and do some thinking on how we do that? Because, you know, the ratepayers of Christchurch do expect to see that. So... Don't need an answer now, but it would be really useful if you can come back um, at, the, at the next one or at a briefing or something and, and, and sort of update us on that. It, it might be a little longer than that, but absolutely, 100%, the way we measure ourselves is a really important part of our economic development um, strategy. We've got to actually, um, uh, I think, have a, a, a relook at some of that. So I'm, I'm very much in your camp. I just don't know how quick. We need to get that. We need to get the strategy sort of, the new sort of revised strategy there first, and then we can look at how we... Yeah, I mentioned. just think it's really important for, I agree. The, for sort of, I guess, transparency I around spending. And also, um, I mean, if that is the case, then we need to reflect on how we've been measuring it since its inception. Yeah. So I'm keen to understand all that. But anyway, just a takeaway for yeah. it would be great. So yeah. James is happy to move the report. Jimmy's happy to second it. Any discussion? All in favour? Aye. Against? Carried. Thank you both Thank for you. coming Thank in. you. Thank you. Great. And now we've got Claire and Tony. Do you want to come on up for the CCHL? So we've got two parts of this, a, a public part and a public excluded part. So do you want to run through what you can now and then we'll have any questions for this section and then when we go to PX, you can obviously ask those commercial, um, commercially sensitive ones as well. Sure. Okay, sorry, just bear with me while I... Okay. Have we got, Good, is Jeremy Good morning and I just put an apology in for Jeremy Smith and Tim Boyd who couldn't be here today, um, hence I'm in the seat. But then I'll pass over to Tony. <clears throat> okay, so um, I'll take it largely as read, but just want to note some key items in the dashboards. Uh, financial performance, um, Orion, LPC and Enable have reported strong results for the period to 31st of March with profit above their SOI targets. It's unlikely that CityCare will meet its financial targets. Um, due to the impacts of COVID restrictions in the first and third quarters, including the 100-day Auckland lockdown. Um, as previously reported, the airport's financial and passenger measures will largely not be achieved. Higher passenger volumes are expected now um, that there's been a return to MIQ-free travel, so we expect to see an improvement in financial results for the airport going forward. Um, for... Uh, in relation to health and safety, the LPC team was devastated by the fatal accident at the port on the 25th of April. Um, ongoing support is in place for the team and investigations are underway. Uh, for sustainability, Enable has performed well on reducing Scope 1 and Scope 3 emissions by converting 70% of their vehicle fleet to 
uh, to electric and hybrid vehicles and three solar installations have been completed on the central office to mitigate against scope 2 emissions. Um, and in terms of paying the uh, living wage to employees, following the work that CityCare has done on the national remuneration framework, uh, by September of this year, all employees in the CCHL group will be paid at or above the living wage. And in terms of contractors, Enable continues to maintain the living wage for all primary contractors. Uh, the airport recently renegotiated their cleaning contract, which includes provisions to pay the living wage. And Orion, LPC and CityCare um, and EcoCentral continue to work on implementing the living wage for ongoing suppliers. We are not already paid. Uh, and just to finish off in other news, uh, on Monday, Enable and Council officially launched Christchurch Free Wi-Fi, and last night at the New Zealand Energy Excellence Awards, Orion's network planning engineer, Yu Yin Ki, won the prize for Young Energy Professional of the Year. Which is a very good result. Um, just to open up to questions. Right, well, thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions for the public session now? Uh, Yanni? Just, just to be clear on the living wage to the contractors. Mm -hmm. Do we know if the cleaners at the airport are currently getting the living wage? And if not, do we know what the time frame is for that? Uh, so, so my understanding uh, is that the contract is in place from FY23. I'm not sure exactly when in FY23, right. um, but there are provisions in there that they must be paid the living wage and retain that level of the living wage. If it goes up, then that has to go up as well. Right, okay, that's good. Um, and... Just um, wondering, like we've had v Venus Aotearoa talk to us, um, and I know that there's kind of a cross council collaboration around different things um, around our companies. Um, but th they've had this really successful local procurement and supplier sort of um, strategy that's do doing really well. I, I just wondered if you, if CCHL is looking at any of the things that they've done through our companies. To look at sort of getting the synergy around maximum benefit to our local producers and suppliers. Um, at this stage, we haven't looked at that, but it does seem right. something that we should consider on at the board. What, and, yeah. yeah. What would be the best way for us to get that? Because I mean, it's I'm pretty sure we've referred to it previously, but it just yeah. I, I mean, I'm just really impressed with what the news that Tatahi are achieving, and it seems like we could get even a greater impact. If we looked across our council companies through CCHL as well, yeah, I, th I think we'll come back and we'll ask the subsidiaries what they're doing. Yeah, I think what would be then, good, what you could do is because um, remember venues when we talked to venues about it, we were suggesting that they go and talk to some of the entities. So I think yeah. we'll taking it back and actually yeah. catching up with venues over yeah. Tahi. Yeah, and then once you can assess what they've done, then you can look at working with the rest of the group and come back yeah. to us. Sounds good. Yeah, that's cool. Thank, thank you. Cheers. Um, just um. Yeah, okay, no, that, that's cool. I guess the only... I, no, it's cool, I'll just I'll let it go. Yep, it's fine. No worries. Um, hey, the only question I had was around, um, I guess, profitability and the dividends for uh, for the year, and it looks like we're sort of on track to meet them. And I just wondered, and I was kind of hoping Jeremy was here for it because he's probably got the historic knowledge of it, but the, the dividend... Like, I find with these papers, what's really useful is to put a bit of context around the annual dividends. So right. it's got in here we're on track for 16.1. Yep. But I guess what the public want to see is given the level of the investment, and we've sort of been having conversations about that, is actually has that gone up on prior years? No. So it has um, reduced compared to prior years, but because we paid that 17 million special dividend um, on RBL property last year, so if you average over the last two years... I think it's a payout ratio of around about 55%. Right. Um, it has been reduced uh, from pre-COVID levels because obviously um, the group's been impacted by that. Yeah, it is good, I guess, just to have that context around it going forward. J just again for the public who are yeah. who are looking at it. So uh, maybe that could be an action to take to yep. Linda's here but, um, okay. going forward. Okay, well, I'm happy to move that report if Aaron's happy to second it. Uh, any discussion? All in favour? All right. Against? That's carried. Great. Thank you. Now we'll move into public excluded. And I think the plan is to, uh, just for anyone that's uh, into it, uh, like Stephen and the like, it'll be, 
We've got obviously the council meeting at two o'clock, and then anything that we don't get through before then, uh, we'll do after after that meeting. So. Cool. Right. Um, so we've got a resolution there to include uh, Tony and Claire, and then the team from the Rod Donald Trust. I'm happy to move that. Uh, Mike's happy to second it. All in favour? Is anyone in favour? I. <laughs> Are they all awake? <laughs> Again, yeah. Against. Carried. Thank you. That's great. So. We'll
So we're now Thanks, back sir. in public. Stand, so this is. Um, we'll so this is key oh. performance results item eight. Next, yep, item eight. Okay. And then it will go to our adjourned meeting. Yes. And then we'll do the. Um, yes. Briefly. Waiting for Stephen's talk. Right, so um, Peter, item eight, key performance results. Um, you'll have figured that we're running to a reasonably tight timeline for this meeting, so any brief remarks, followed by questions, followed okay. by consideration of the report. Oh, good. <laughs> Look, I can, I can keep this quite brief. Um, this is the key performance report that comes before the uh, finance and capital reports. Uh, results for this month are, as they have been in the last quarter, very steady. There's been very little change, either up or down. Um, Briefly, in terms of levels of service, we are a couple of percent below target, and the reasons for that are well known to you around COVID and the wastewater plant. Um, we're a little below on capital delivery, and that is also known to you through supply chain problems and other issues. Planning capital for the years ahead uh, is on track for next year, and not quite on track for the year after, but that was always going to be a stretch. And in terms of operational uh, expenditure, we have a substantial surplus of 28 down to 20 after carry forwards so overall extremely stable that's where the year will end next month great thank you any questions Yanni um, so really appreciate that you've done yesterday a newsline story about sealing the deal for Christchurch's asphalt roads as someone who asked through the draft annual plan to get an understanding of our sealing program I'm just concerned that um, like this looks like a really good good thing, but it's kind of, I, I just don't quite understand the quantum of it, whether we could do more um, and get better um, cost savings um, and whether it changes the dynamic between the cost of chip sealing versus the cost of asphalting, given the previous presentation that we've heard when we've asked for greater asphalt. Is it? I mean, I totally appreciate what staff have done here. It seems like a really sensible solution. I'm just worried at a governance level, we don't seem to have any discussion or report or anything that talks about um, this specific project. Okay. Look, um, I know that Lynette is working to the levels of service from the LTP, but um, I've tic tac with her this morning. The difficulty is that most of the senior roading team are down with COVID. We yeah, sorry, I, I, I get in, that. We need to yeah. come back to you with a with a report. Yeah, I mean, I just, I, I mean, I really appreciate the fact that staff have actually saw a, a level of service that's failing and tried to adopt a new approach to try and improve the satisfaction. I think that's really positive. It's just frustrating that we go through a draft annual plan process where none of this gets highlighted, despite questions being asked around it, and we get a newsline story. So, I mean, I don't know, can we get maybe, I mean, really the key question I've got is, should we be doing, should we be spending more money on the budget around this um, resurfacing rather, or rejuvenation? And would that give us longer term savings? Look, I, I don't, I won't speak for Lynette. Yeah, yeah, no, I that's can't. Cool. But um, what I will say is if you look to um, her response on road sealing in the report that you've got here on your page, 37, she raises a whole series of issues around why sealing is the way it is and provides a lot of information there. And I'm sure that when she does provide a briefing, she'll talk about capacity as well as budget. Yeah. I... So that's what we've got yeah. to work with today. But when the team is back, I'm sure they can expand yeah, should, on it. Should we flag a, a briefing on it or... Well, there's further information to come. Let's think about whether that information is best provided in a briefing or by some other means. But, sure. you know, Peter, you're in a difficult position because you, you can't answer on behalf of the, the staff that have got the, the detailed knowledge that, that we need. Um, yeah, let's have a think about whether a briefing or a workshop or, or some other form of communication is the best way sure. to do that. Yeah, because, um, I mean, I'm also kind of keen to understand on the, in the remedial action, improving our software and processes to better manage our roading assets. 
All right. Let's let's take all of this to a meeting where the people that can answer the question are in the room at the time. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Are there any other questions? All right. So I'm. Oh, so Sam, you're moving um, receipt of the um, report. Melanie, you're happy to second. All right. So moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? All those in favour say aye. 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 Against. That's carried. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, can we, um, if we can do this quickly, then let's do it. So item nine, the financial performance report. Leah, you're presenting this one. Yeah, so so obviously this is the end of the May. It is uh, 30th of June today, best day of the work, uh, year for an accountant, I can tell you. Um, so um, so the report that you have in front of you has is current, it's, it's continued where we were planning in the sense of having a, after carry forwards a $20 million surplus. Um, I hope they'll be able to say that's confirmed in a month's time. Um, but the key thing here, and you will, the carry forwards will be coming through for approval in August, um, July, August, as we go through the numbers to actually confirm that and what we do. One of the key things, the only key message that I really wanted to, I wanted to say two things. One was, um, it's, you know, the it's a very, it's a good result given where we are. Um, and the, you know, I, I was asked during the week in regards to, because we kept on talking about how we're going to repay COVID borrowing. And um, and I just wanted to reflect for this, and I think it's actually quite important to do this in, in a public setting in the sense that we, this, this council uh, intended to borrow approximately 72 million because of COVID. That was the plan. In the end, we only borrowed 26 million, which is fantastic. Um, and as at during 2020, that was what we had. Uh, of the last two years, and including what we believe we can do this, we will have repaid it all this year. That's an absolutely fantastic Good. result. Um, and, you know, I was also asked what we can, you know, with some of that surplus, the best impact we can have for future uh, for rates decreases is repaying that debt. Um, so using it, that's the best impact we can have. So I just wanted to highlight that for the public and for the councillors today. Um, but other than that, I'll take questions. Great. Thank you very much. And, th and thanks for that comment. I mean, it's always worth remembering that the interest that we pay on debt is OPEX and therefore directly affects rates. Are there any questions? Yanni? Thanks. Just on page um, 48, 9.1 insurance claims, what, what's the process for us who aren't on the insurance subcommittee to get updated on the fire claims for the wastewater treatment plant? And um, I'm sorry if, I, if we've had some information, but the EQC insurance discussion with our social housing, has, has there been anything progressed in that regard. So we had an update on that at the last meeting and I'm not right. aware of any update since then. If you wanted to ask a question outside of this meeting, if there was an update, I'm sure we would have had it. Oh, okay. Um, I, I just wondered whether it could be recorded in the future. I mean, I know this is going to counsel, but maybe under insurance, we could just get a line of sight on a regular basis on the EQC stuff so it doesn't get lost. Yep. So Leah, you can, yep, note, can that. note that. Yep. Uh, and we have an insurance subcommittee next week, so we will talk about how we feedback anything that we can to the main council. When we can, when we and can. when there's something right. substantive to Correct. report. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you. No further questions. So I'm again happy. Oh, Jimmy, you've got. Quickly, quickly. I still don't know this one, but here paragraph seven point four. You know, uh, this uh, funding part is pretty cheap. I still don't know. Ratified in April of the finance performance committee. But we will be the corrected in until the October. I just don't know why it happened this gap. What well, happened? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, Steve, do you want to answer it, or because you'll do it really more succinctly? You've got thirty seconds. That's all you're getting. Yeah, just quickly. Because uh, we did understand. explain this in April. <coughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Right, you're showing me up. I'm sorry, I was doing something else, Jimmy. No, sorry, it's the funding you... breach. So the, the, what we explained oh, yes, in yeah, yeah, last month. Right. Just give it two second. Yep. Easy. We've been trying to keep. Most of our borrowing relatively short term because of the yes. potential impact of three waters. Um, we've got quite a lot maturing in April 29, yes. um, and we have a requirement to have at least a certain amount, a certain percentage beyond seven years. Okay. So when we went from, well, obviously that chunk as it goes from April 29, yes. as it moves from that more than seven year bucket to less than seven year bucket, that would um, breach our policy. Okay. Uh, so we came to you back in, I think it was March, yes. to say, look, this is about to happen. Um, our recommendation is that we tolerate that breach temporarily because we didn't need to borrow any long-term money at the time. Okay. Uh, we could, borrowing in advance of requirements, but we recommended we didn't. We just waited so we can correct it 
in September, October, and uh, you agree that that's what we should do. If that makes sense. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. So I'm happy to move this. Do I have a seconder? Um, Jimmy, you're happy to second. Excellent. Is there any discussion? All those in favour say aye. Aye. Against, that's carried. Okay, so I'm now going to adjourn the finance and performance meeting until the end of the council meeting. So the council meeting starts at two o'clock. Um, when the council meeting ends, then we'll resume the um, finance and performance meeting. So I'll adjourn until that time. Thank you.